Australia is a vacation destination of which nothing is ensured except adventure, and while it's home to some of the world's most beautiful terrain and oceans, it is also unforgiving in the vastness of its landscape. Byron Bay, located in the state of New South Wales, Australia, is a prime confluence of adventure and spiritual awakening, with just a little pretentiousness thrown in with the picturesque landscape. Byron Bay is a popular tourist destination for those bold and in the know, and is home to a robust nightlife. But those who have visited say that it also has a reputation for being a bit ostentatious in its rugged and lost coast aesthetic. Generally, visitors to the area say most locals are friendly to those passing through, but they also say that some longtime residents can be wary of the constant influx of generally young and unfamiliar faces. Boasting nearly 2 million visitors a year, this relatively tiny town is unique in that it has a larger amount of visitors annually than it does actual citizens. One of those visitors was 18-year-old Theo Hayes of Belgium. He had spent the majority of the previous year traveling in and around Australia. Initially, Theo was torn between attending college, like many of his peers, and taking a gap year to travel. But ultimately, he decided that studying engineering at university could be put off a year, as adventure waits for no one. He would soon find, though, that misadventure is just as impatient and fickle a creature, as his gap year would soon end in grim uncertainty for both friends and family. Theo enjoyed his trip immensely, according to sources close to him. He spent a great deal of time with his cousin, Lisa Hayes, who fondly recalled how Theo was unique in his perspective on a gap year. She recalls that while other high school grads were spending their first year of freedom using recreational drugs and drinking in excess, Theo was much more deliberate in his seeking out of spiritual fulfillment through nature. Friends who knew him both in Australia and back at home in Belgium state that Theo was the type to actually care about having a real conversation and strived to form connections with those everywhere he went. His cousin also recalls his knack for planning and keeping organized. Theo was seen as one of the more responsible of his age group. He was close to his family overseas and spoke with his mom multiple times a week without fail. The 18-year-old arrived in Byron Bay on Wednesday, May 29th of 2019. His unofficial itinerary consisted of him using his remaining vacation time just hanging around the town. He was not tied to any particular activity as long as he was able to make it to his Greyhound bus, which would pick him up on June 3rd in order for him to go back to the Sydney-Melbourne area. He then planned on flying home to Belgium to start the next leg of his journey on the way to university and then a career. Theo chose to stay at Wake Up Hostel, one of the better and more esteemed hostels in the area. Located in Belongol, it is a bit removed from the main downtown area, but still a prime location for tourists as the hostel is only a 20 minute walk from the town square. As an added attraction for tourists on a budget, Wake Up Hostel allows travelers to use their bikes to get around and the hostel also provides a free shuttle to and from town. The entire town of Byron Bay is rather condensed in its spread, and locals state that cars are not a necessity here as the entire town is accessible via walking, if you're fit enough. Theo managed to get a room to himself in the hostel, and although he roomed alone, in what friends and family lovingly recall was quite typical for him, Theo quickly made friends with some of the other backpackers there and wasted no time in getting out to the local social scene to enjoy his last days in the country that he'd called home for more than a year. 
Theo took the free shuttle bus into town on the early evening of May 31st, 2019. This would be his last night that he was ever seen. That night was a frigid one, right in the middle of Australia's winter season. It was, in fact, the coldest night on historical record for the months of May and June in Byron. Historical weather data from Cape Byron Weather Station states that the high that day was 17 degrees Celsius, which is 62 degrees Fahrenheit, but that upon sunset, the temperature dropped all the way to 9 degrees Celsius, which is only 48 degrees Fahrenheit. This low temperature would not have been expected by Theo nor his friends, as it is not usual for the area. Theo and his buddies made their way to the Great Northern Hotel to purchase some rosé wine. CCTV footage captures them making the purchase at 7.45 p.m. In the security footage later obtained by detectives, nothing unusual or amiss was seen. It seemed like it was just a normal liquor transaction made by carefree young men about to have a night out on the town. After purchasing the rosé, Theo and his new friends then went back to the hostel via the free shuttle bus and enjoyed the wine with others on the porch of the hostel. Later, Theo and some other tourists utilized the shuttle again, this time to go to a bar called Cheeky Monkeys, a well-known bar with what some locals say had a bit of a sordid reputation. As in the early 2000s, it was ranked as one of the most violent bars in Australia. While this may have been true in 2019, locals have said that the bar's reputation for mischief has changed recently, with new ownership by a chain company. Located on what is one of the two main roads in town, this bar is pretty central in its location, though it is a few blocks from the main town square. Visitors have complained that a lack of proper lighting and often very light foot traffic can make walking in town at night an eerie experience. And while the beach town of Byron would be busy in the summer season, the winter months saw less of an influx of tourists. And this night, especially due to the unusual cold, was a quiet one. Later, bartenders at Cheeky Monkeys would report that they were only at about a quarter capacity. Theo purchased two drinks from the bar, and this, accompanied by the wine that he had previously consumed, reportedly caused some sort of visible inebriation as after an only relatively short amount of time, Theo was escorted out by security guards at around 11 p.m. Witnesses say Theo was not being crass, but was unsteady on his feet. There's debate about how intoxicated Theo was, with multiple witnesses claiming he wasn't that drunk, but others saying that it was rather obvious. There are no reports of aggression from either Theo nor his friends, and it is unclear what caused him to be escorted out. But CCTV footage captures his departure from the bar. This footage would capture the last known time Theo Hayes was seen alive. Getting back to the hostel was a simple process from the bar. Locals say that if you simply followed the bright lights and neon signs, Wake Up Hostel would be relatively easy to find, even at night after a few drinks. It should have been a 20-minute walk from the bar to the hostel. However, after obtaining Theo's Google records, it was determined that Theo never went back to the hostel that night. But that seemingly wasn't for lack of trying. Theo left the bar at 11 p.m. CCTV footage shows him walking off into the low-lit sidewalks of Kingsley Street, which is a road that runs perpendicular to Johnson, the street that the bar was on. In a move that has confounded friends, family, and investigators, Theo then proceeded to take the most absurd route at sometimes worrisome speeds. Google Maps data shows that Theo, despite having a phone to tell him otherwise, walked in the opposite direction of the hostel. He went from Kingsley Street to Tennyson Street, then to the Youth Activity Center, which was a large open field. Data shows that he then walked at a very fast pace all the way to the Millen track. He may have been running, but the data is not exact. After moving rapidly through the Millen track, Theo headed to nearby Tallow Beach, but he did so in a very indirect fashion. This path would have led him through heavy brush, which investigators say would have been almost impossible to navigate at such speeds if you were not already familiar with the area. 
This is one reason why some speculate that Theo may not have been alone. His route was bizarre to both locals and family alike. Anyone with eyes could see the hostel was in the opposite direction. So where was Theo going? And was he alone or had he been walking with another person? His parents believed that he would not have left without a friend in tow because he was a social and safe person. Locals say the pitch blackness of the bush where Theo was moving through at that time of night can be discombobulating, even to those familiar with the area. So the fact that Theo made it through in such a short amount of time is rather puzzling. Another reason some suspect that Theo was not alone is that tourists simply do not go to that area. The Milne track is not grand, nor beautiful, nor is it even easily accessible. The track simply leads from Milne Street through dense and unforgiving bushland and out to the coast of Tallow's Beach. There's nothing special nor remarkable about the location. Google Maps data shows that as Theo made his way quickly out of the bushland, he headed towards Cozy Corner Beach. This was all happening while Theo was still actively messaging people. From there, cell phone records pulled by authorities show that in this time, Theo texted a few friends. His friends insist that it was him texting and not an imposter, because the messages were in French, his native tongue, and were in his style of speaking syntactically. Reports released by police state that at 12.50 a.m. that early morning, Theo sent a Facebook message to a friend regarding an upcoming U2 tour that was to happen in Australia. The last text Theo sent was to his stepsister at 12.55 a.m. The message was on WhatsApp, and police have not released the previous text messages, so the media only has access to the vague and morbidly upbeat last text. The final text sent by Theo simply said, Merci, the French word for thank you, followed by a kiss emoji. This was the last message that he would ever send to anybody that we know of. Google data pulled by police show that in this time period, Theo also viewed an unknown YouTube video. Data pulled from his Google account shows that he searched Google Maps multiple times for the route back to his backpacker hostel. But it is unknown why he made and continued to make the choice to deviate from what would have been simple directions given by the Google Maps app. Then, right before 1am, Theo went offline. Theo's cell phone signal pinged at 1.42pm the next afternoon, June 1st. This ping, which was different from internet data usage in that it is merely a connection of the cell phone talking to a local cell tower, something even non-smartphones do. Which meant at that particular time, Theo's cell phone was on, but for how long and for what purpose, nobody knows or police have not released. The tower it was connected to was the Cape Byron cell tower, which is close to Cozy Corner Beach. After this 1.42m ping, Theo's phone did not make a cellular connection ever again. In the next few days, the hostel would not report Theo missing, even after his checkout date had come and gone. While some were highly critical of this decision because it did delay the most important 48 hours of a missing person's investigation, what some media reports and many critics forget or omit is the context and location of this particular backpacker's hostel. The sheer amount of young visitors who come and go from this locale without warning gave the hostel no initial reason to worry. Drug use and alcohol use by tourists who came to rediscover their spiritual side through nature was common and therefore, this type of behavior was not out of the ordinary, and usually due simply to wanderlust and not misfortune. Eventually, after almost 72 hours of not hearing from him, Theo's mother notified local authorities. A missing persons investigation was started, but by that time, many complained that the trail had gone cold. Investigators searched his hostel room, but found it undisturbed, with no signs of a struggle and no signs that Theo had attempted to pack up to leave. All of his suitcases, hygiene items, and passport were still where they had been left, and it seemed that he had only packed up enough to go out for a night on the town. 
An extensive search was carried out, with authorities scouring the air, land, and sea surrounding Byron Bay. The search and rescue workers used dogs, drones, helicopters, climbers, and divers to try and find Theo. On the 10th of May, Theo's parents arrived at Byron Bay and began searching alongside local volunteers. They distributed missing person flyers all over town, but despite exhaustive search efforts, no trace of Theo was found. On the 3rd of July, the police officially called off the physical search. Nearly one month after he was reported missing, volunteers continued searching for the missing 18-year-old. A few days later, on July 7th, a volunteer search group found a cap that appeared to match the one that Theo was last seen wearing in the CCTV footage obtained by police. The cap was found in the lighthouse area, where his cell phone had last pinged. Theo's family is certain it was Theo's hat that was found, but a DNA test result has yet to be released. Theo is one of over 2,600 people in Australia who are listed as long-term missing. This classification is given to those who have not been seen or heard from in three or more months. Six of those on the list vanished just a few kilometers from Byron Bay, and their mysterious disappearances have never been solved. These deaths span three decades, and while police say they do not see a connection across age, race, or gender, they cannot rule out any connections at this time, either overall or within patterns or subgroups of historical missing victims. Three weeks after Theo was last seen, a local resident of Byron was walking through Clark's Beach Dunes and came upon a large stick with an ominous message and a sinister implication. The large stick appeared to have bloodstains on it. The wife of the man who found the stick recalls that her husband was walking when he noticed the obtrusive object first, and then the strange lettering, and then the blood-like stains. She posted a picture of the stick to social media while she waited for police to come collect it. And while she says authorities did pick it up from her, they didn't treat or process the area like a crime scene, nor did they take any photographs of the surrounding area. The stick, thick in its girth and roughly 1.5 meters long, almost 5 feet, has the words, The Judge, marked on it in big black letters. One end of the stick is wrapped in duct tape. No word has come on the processing of this stick, but investigators often withhold information on test results so as to exclude false confessions or so as not to impede an arrest. Soon after, a woman came forward and told police that on June 2nd, two days after Theo went missing, while driving on Pacific Highway, she saw two men on the road. One of the men, who appeared to be in his 30s, flagged her down near Coffs Harbor, 240 kilometers south of Byron Bay, at around 4.30 a.m. The other man seemed to be lying on the road as if he was unconscious or dead. However, she decided not to stop as she felt unsafe, and later she called police and uploaded a video on Facebook describing the incident. In it, she is crying as she was worried someone might have been seriously injured. The police checked the area but could not find the men. The woman would later see a news story about Theo, and she realized that the man lying on the road was wearing light-colored pants and black shoes, the same clothes that Theo had been wearing when last seen alive on CCTV footage. She told authorities, but never heard back from them. For now, Theo's father has the last word. In a tearful plea to the media while at the police station, he said, quote, I promised Theo's little brother that I would bring his brother home. Please help me keep my promise to him. If you have any information on this case, or if you recall visiting the area of Byron Bay during this time period of May 29th to June 2nd, 2019, and may have pictures, videos, or memories of these days, please contact Crime Stoppers at one 800 333 000 or go to nsw.crimestoppers.com.au Q 
Kirsty was born on January 18, 1983, and raised in Ashburton, New Zealand. An avid lover of the Backstreet Boys, 15-year-old Kirsty was described as joyful, trustworthy, and most importantly, kind by all who knew her. She was artistic in nature. She excelled in drama and the writing of poetry. However, she struggled in some of the core academics at her high school. Her friends recall that she was as straight-laced as they came and against the use of drugs or alcohol, as she had seen personally the effects in her own family that substances could have on a person. Her father, Sid, a former Royal Navy sailor, was 47 at the time, and it was no secret that he suffered from the disease of alcoholism. Kirsty told friends in private that her father unfortunately became highly agitated when inebriated, although his family clarifies that he was not specifically violent. Being in the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealanders were enjoying their summer. January, in contrast to the wintry images conjured by those in the Northern Hemisphere, is a month of sunshine in Ashburton, New Zealand, and therefore, for her 16th birthday, Kirsty's mom was to host a pool party to be held on Monday, January 18th, over the prolonged school summer break for the community. The last day she was seen alive was marked with excitement by Kirsty and cautious trepidation by her parents, Jill and Sid. Kirsty was looking forward to the first overnight with her boyfriend, Graham, who was coming over for a family dinner and had permission from Kirsty's parents to sleep over in Kirsty's room. This was a point of contention between husband and wife, as well as between father and daughter. Jill recalls that prior to Kirstie's boyfriend coming over, her daughter had played for her a typical love ballad, and the teen had said that the song lyrics mirrored her feelings for her new boyfriend. And while Jill, Kirstie's mom, was comfortable with the direction that the relationship was taking, those close to the family say that her father, Sid, was not so pleased with the turn of events and had said that the approaching co-ed sleepover should not occur, but such objections had fallen on deaf ears. Kirstie's brother, John, 19 at the time, was a bright and capable student at the University of Canterbury, going into his third year of his bachelor's degree in science. Jill, Kirstie's mother, recalls that while the four of them may not have been the perfect family, they were still just that, she recalls, a family. That fateful day, John, Kirstie's brother, departed for his summer job shortly after 9 a.m. He was doing some temporary work picking berries for the season while on holiday from his nearby university. At 9.30 a.m., Kirstie's mother, Jill, departed for her job for the day. Jill later recalls saying goodbye to Kirstie with their normal love and affection, despite the somewhat everyday tumultuous atmosphere that hovered above the household. Those close to the Bentleys say that it was well known that the family argued rather frequently, but those in town also conceded that in a family with a 19-year-old son and a 15-year-old daughter, such a state of constant disagreement is not uncommon. While Sid and Kirsty had been close when she was younger, her teenage years, as is common with many children, brought about a stark divide between father and daughter. Sid had previously attended AA meetings in 1993 and had also spent time in a rehab located in Hamner Springs, but those close to him knew he had relapsed back into drinking, which resulted in even more familial arguments. At 10.30 a.m., Kirstie went to meet with her friend Leanne at the Ashburton Library, and from there they went shopping in the local stores. Witness reports indicate that the two teens may have also visited the dairy, a type of local convenience store. Sid says that he went into the nearby town of Christchurch to run errands at around 11.15 a.m. that day. Sometime in the early afternoon hours, Kirsty and Leanne ate lunch at McDonald's. At that same time, Kirsty's brother, John, arrived home from work. At around 2.30 p.m., Leanne's older sister gave Kirsty a ride back home. John recalls greeting Kirsty and telling her that her boyfriend, Graham, had called the house and had left a message. And while no details of the message were available, the general gist was that her boyfriend was asking Kirstie to call him back, which she did at 2.38 p.m. But her boyfriend was not home, so Kirstie left a message with his brother asking him to return her call. At around 2.40 p.m., Kirstie apparently decides to take the family dog, Abby, for a walk. Police timestamped this based on a sighting by a neighborhood friend. 
Kirstie's brother, John, says that he was in his room watching TV and listening to music throughout the duration of Christy being home after relaying the phone message to her. John says that he does not recall Kirstie leaving, but said that he may have heard the slam of their external gate as she left, although he says he is not certain. Between 3 p.m. and 3.05 p.m., Kirstie and Abby are seen walking past by her neighbor. The neighbor, 11-year-old Sarah, clearly recalls waving to a girl walking her dog towards the direction of the river at around 3 p.m. Sarah was familiar with this girl and knew her as Kirstie as they lived in close proximity to one another, with Kirstie residing around the corner in a red brick bungalow at 165 South. From about 3.05 to 3.50 p.m., there were no witnesses to Kirstie walking Abby. At 3.50 p.m., it is on record that Kirstie bought some candy from the owner of a shop located on Beach Road. At 4 p.m., witnesses saw Kirstie and Abby on Dobson Street. Another witness sighting puts her near what locals call the dairy. These fleeting accounts of Kirstie would be the last confirmed sighting of the teen while she was still alive. At around 4.20 p.m., Kirstie's boyfriend, Graham, called her back, but it is now Kirstie that isn't at her house. Upon Graham's second call at 4.20, John got up to get Kirstie, and seeing her absent, John realized that his sister had been quiet for quite some time. He says that is when he realized that the dog was also missing and that Abby's leash was also gone. Between 5 p.m. and 5.15 p.m., Kirstie's mother, Jill, returns home from work. Her son, John, in an unusual and alarming fashion, approached her car before she could even get out and questioned her as to Christie's whereabouts, as by that time she had been gone for an alarming amount of time. Even though John did not hear Christie leave, by his accounts, from the time of her boyfriend's phone call to his own mother's return, almost one hour had passed, far longer than Kirstie would normally take to walk Abby. Jill recalls that the first words out of John's mouth were, quote, where the F is Kirstie? In the next 45 minutes, between 5.15 p.m. and 6 p.m., there was confusion within the home, bordering on panic. Jill, after confirming that the dog's leash and the dog was also gone, along with Kirstie, goes out to search the neighborhood, but not before trepidatiously calling Kirstie's boyfriend, who was slated to come over that night, to confirm that Kirstie was not already with him. Crestfallen, Jill received news that Kirstie is not with her boyfriend and that she had not been there that day. So, Jill, on foot, began her search for her 15-year-old daughter, hurriedly walking the path that Kirstie would have normally taken to get to the Ashburton River. While searching the path, Jill recalls that she steadily became more and more anxiety-ridden, and so she decided to go back home. There, she and John, who had been waiting at the home in case Kirstie was to return, relay the worrisome news to each other that each was empty-handed. She and John restart their search at 6 p.m., shortly after reconvening. While Kirstie's brother John was out searching the entirety of their usual dog walking route, shortly after 6 p.m., Kirstie's father, Sid, came home and was informed of the burgeoning crisis. At around 6.20 p.m., a little less than two hours from the initial realization that Kirstie was gone, the family made the crucial decision to call police. Contrary to popular belief, when a minor is involved, there is no waiting period necessary to file a missing persons report. A massive search ensued, comprised of both members of the investigatory squad as well as members of the community, and what investigators would uncover still haunts the memories of the Ashburton community as well as the world who watched from afar to this day. The search was becoming more and more difficult as night fell upon the small community of Ashburton, New Zealand. Upon hearing reports of a barking dog near the river by a neighbor, Sid goes with the neighbor to investigate and claiming he had a migraine vomits on the drive over. It was no secret that Sid was an alcoholic and members of the community agree that most likely he'd been at a bar or off somewhere drinking prior to the family emergency. The police sent John out on his bike to continue the search and eventually John met up with his mother, Jill, on the trail leading out to the river. At 8 p.m., his dad, Sid, drives out to find them and to take them home. Sid goes back out to continue searching for Kirstie on his own, later telling police that he drove the 15-minute trip to Wakoani Beach to search there. He returned to the house around midnight. John, who was undeterred and unable to sleep, had been out searching again, also coming home a bit after midnight. 
Upon returning from their respective searches, father and son made coffee and returned to the search, this time together, and looked for Christy and Abby from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Scouring the river track, a local rugby club field, and a few local industrial locations, father and son came home again empty-handed. At 10 a.m. the next day, due to the tenacious work of the community, Abby the dog would be found alive and well, but Kirstie's whereabouts were still unknown. Abby, the dog Kirstie had been walking when last seen, was found tightly tied up to the trunk of a tree, located within a dense patch of brush and pines near the Ashburton River, close to nearby Robillard Park. Abby was found just a three-minute walk from Kirstie's home. The dog was dehydrated, but unharmed. Kiersey's family, as well as her extended family, including her uncle and the community at large, had previously searched that area, and Jill, Kiersey's mom, swears that Abby would have audibly barked at the sound of her voice. This caused investigators to wonder if the dog had been placed there after the fact. An additional confusion regarding the dog was that Kiersey's parents initially claimed the leash that Abby was tied up with was not theirs, but they later changed that statement. Police came to believe that Abby had been tied up to the tree around 6.30 p.m. and stated that the manner in which Abby was tethered meant she had been unleashed prior to being tied to the tree. Police believed that this was done possibly by someone Abby was familiar with. Analysis of the scene led investigators to believe that, while it was not out of the realm of possibilities that Kirstie herself tethered the dog to the tree, the tightness in which the leash was fashioned led investigators to think that it may have been someone with less affection towards the dog, but also could have been the result of rushing by any party. The key and timely discovery of Abby the dog was made by Dave Saunders, a veteran search and rescue operator. He had noticed a flattened trail of grass leading from the trail by the river into the woods. He recalled that upon following the flattened grass, he came upon the black dog, who had been silent the entire time he was there. When he approached Abby, she greeted him with neither joy nor fear, but with what he interpreted as sadness. He recalls that he mentioned Christie's name to the dog, and that elicited the most physical response, with the dog perking her ears and looking interested. Near where the dog was tied up, around 30 meters away, investigators found a worrisome sight. Kirstie's underwear, as well as her boxer shorts, which she had worn over them, were strung high up, almost six feet, in the dense scrub of the forest. It was an alarming sight. They were found hanging off of a branch, almost as if on display. The investigators reflected that the entire scene seemed staged. Detectives said that the undergarments were seemingly placed there intentionally, as opposed to the result of an accidental tossing. The surrounding brush showed no indentations or markings of a struggle, and the underwear found hanging in the trees was clean, with no evidence that it had ever touched the forest ground. Additionally, the clothing was not ripped, nor was it dirty. Police were confused by the tone of the scene. The items were not the haphazard leftovers of a passionate crime, but that of a calculated and cunning attempt to deter investigators' attention. But away from what? What was the scene attempting to hide, and who was bold enough to commit such a brazen act in what was a relatively public space, often trekked by those making their way to the river in the hot summer days? Abby the dog was known by neighbors to be mildly anxious and was known to have subsequent aggressive episodes, which is why some speculate that whoever tied up the dog was familiar enough with it that it did not fight back. While some point to Abby's anxiety as proof that the killer was familiar with the Bentley family, or possibly even a member of the Bentley family itself, others point out that in moments of fear, a dog could be subdued or coerced using a variety of methods, although Abby was visually physically unharmed. On January 3rd, as a test to gauge whether or not Abby the dog would have been responsive to such calls, police again tied her to the same spot and called her name, as the searchers had done in the prior days. The dog did not respond via barking, which helped to prove that she most likely had been there since the evening Christy had gone missing, despite Christy's mother's claim that her dog would have alerted to the sound of her voice. The dog was also tested for drugs, such as sedatives, in her system, but nothing was found. However, this could be the result of the drug being out of her system by the time tests were conducted. The dog's placement, alongside the blatant display of Christie's shorts and underwear, 
cast a pall of sadness and suspicion across the tight-knit community of Ashburton, New Zealand. As the investigation progressed, police and volunteers exhaustively searched the surrounding areas. In what became a national response, the New Zealand Army sent their own soldiers, as well as supplies, to aid in the search efforts for 15-year-old Kirsty. By January 6th, the Bentley family was forced to stay in a motel due to the fact that their house was considered a crime scene, as a week had passed with no news on Kirsty's whereabouts. Police examined the home, carrying out luminol testing, which is when a spray is applied to various surfaces of the house in order to detect the presence of blood, even after it has been cleaned up. But the tests did not uncover any new evidence. Upon being asked for his car keys to continue the investigation, Sid is recalled as having thrown them at the police officer, inflecting a few choice words in the process. Those close to the family say that Sid was the type of person who believed that the government had too much of an overreach into the personal lives of citizens, and the fact that he was made to stay in a motel while the police searched his home, and the fact that they wanted his car keys, seemed to be too much for his temper. Upon witnessing this incident, investigators wondered, was this the raging of a worried father, or that of a guilty man? Tragically, on January 17, 1999, the eve of the 16th anniversary of the day Kirsty was miraculously brought into this world, it would be discovered that she had been brutally taken out of it forever. John Watts and Brendan Wanhalla, two local cannabis cultivators, accidentally uncovered the grisly scene while on a scouting trip about 50 kilometers, a bit over 30 miles, removed from the town of Ashburton. Kirsty's decomposing and therefore visually unrecognizable body was nestled under tree branches and leaves, deep in a grove of pine trees located on the north side of the Rakaia Gorge. Found in the fetal position, Kirsty's body was recovered in a clearing located off of a public trail in the Camp Gully area of the Rakaia Gorge. Investigators mused that the area was more akin to a place one would go to find privacy off of the public path as opposed to a place that one would go to for recreation or while on a walk. Police believe the teen was intentionally placed where she was found post-mortem. Autopsy revealed that the teen had been killed by a single blunt force trauma to the right side of the back of her head. The autopsy report stated that the single blow to the head was made with enough force that her skull fractured. No murder weapon was recovered. The coroner stated that Kirsty succumbed to her injuries shortly after the attack. Based on analysis of her stomach contents and the state of decomposition, the coroner believes Kirsty was killed the same night that she was reported missing. The medical examiner noted in the autopsy report that there was no visible sign of a struggle. Many times, victims of an attack who were able to fight back have broken fingernails or scratch marks on their skin. However, Kirsty's body did not carry those hallmarks. Kirsty was found wearing a black tank top. Her black Colorado shoes with white soles were still on. But notably, the bottom of the teen's shoes contained no traces of rock or particulate from the river track where she was found. Kirsty was found with the blue sarong she had been wearing, a loose wrap-type skirt patterned with white butterflies. The skirt was unclipped and placed over her body in a way that may have denoted remorse, as killers who care for their victim's body post-mortem often do so by covering them with some sort of blanket or item of clothing. This can be interpreted as having felt a connection to the victim be it a perceived or real-life one. Christy's hair was down, which differs from some of the witness accounts, which reported her as having had her hair up in a ponytail. Her family and friends also say that whenever she went for a walk, she would wear her hair up in a ponytail, so the fact that her hair was down and her scrunchie on her wrist stood out to them. At a nearby farm, tire tracks were seen and printed in the ground, which could have indicated someone drove as close as their car could allow to the river track and then walked on foot from there with Christy. Crime scene techs poured a plaster cast of the tracks in hopes of matching them to a car, but to no avail. Because investigators surmised that Christy's body was not dragged but carried to the site, they believed the perpetrator to be one of considerable strength, as her slim body was still a considerable weight for any average strength adult to carry at around 120 pounds or 54 kilograms. Due to the lack of drag marks present at the scene, police believe that the perpetrator may have had an accomplice. Police asked other local cannabis growers to come forward with any relevant information, 
but no new info was gleaned. Multiple witness sightings seem to prove that Kirstie really did leave the house with Abby that afternoon, but that she may have returned home at some point as the clothing descriptions differ. This information muddles the time of death as the state of decomposition made it impossible for the coroner to lock in a time of death, instead medically estimating it between 3.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. on the day that she went missing. The body's advanced stage of decomposition also made it impossible to tell whether or not the teen was sexually assaulted, although investigators have hinted that they have crime scene evidence which they will not release to the public that indicates what, quote, type of offender was involved. The sarong that was found on Christie's body is the same sarong that she was observed wearing when on Dobson Street that day. However, witnesses also say they observed her wearing black track pants, which made investigators question whether or not Kirstie had actually come home and changed clothes at some point, or if witnesses who saw her and Abby walking were mistakenly placing her at that location from a previous day's sightings. It is possible that some of the witness sightings took place on a different day, and media reports make no mention of the recovery of any black pants. Some question Kiersey's father's response when he was told of the gruesome discovery. Police recalled that his first statement was in the form of a question, asking if Kiersey had been found by accident or if someone had witnessed something specific. Detective Senior Sergeant Lance Corcoran says he believes the crime scene was staged to confuse police, and later, British police inspector and criminal profiler Chuck Burton stated that he agreed and that the staging may indicate that the perpetrator was in fact someone close to Kirsty, someone known by her, and that the crime scene was made to look like a random attacker had abducted her with sexual malintent. No sign of a struggle was found at either crime scene, not where Kirsty was found, nor in the clearing where Abby was tied up. The only thing amiss was the boxer shorts and underwear seemingly placed there intentionally. Logically, police had to look at all available suspects, and as with any murder of a child, the first and most logical assumption is for investigators to investigate the family. Jill had a good relationship with her daughter, and they were eager for her upcoming birthday celebration. Jill was verified to have been at work all day and has been tireless in her pursuit of justice. Police never considered her a person of interest. Because John, 19 at the time, was the only one at home during Kirstie's arrival and subsequent permanent departure, gossip swirled regarding a potential hostility between her and John. The gossip stated that this may have stemmed from disagreements over Kirstie's boyfriend, but there was never any evidence to back up this claim. Police point out that John did not have access to a vehicle and therefore would not have been capable of disposing her body in Camp Gully but others say that there is a chance he could have been working with an accomplice. The multiple sightings of Kirsty that occurred around the time of 4 p.m., coupled with the fact that John was physically at home to take the 4.30 call from Graham, and the fact that he was still home 30 minutes later when Jill arrived, provided him with a reasonably tight alibi. Sid, who passed away in 2015, was considered a suspect, as it was said that he was critical of his almost 16-year-old daughter's relationship with her boyfriend. To add on to suspicion, Sid was unable to provide an alibi to investigators and has not been able to provide any receipts or evidence to his whereabouts. While he first claimed that he had been running errands in the nearby city of Christchurch, a subsequent head injury, which occurred when Sid says he slammed his head into a kitchen cabinet, left him with a vision-like changed story. He now claimed that he had been incorrect about his whereabouts that day and that he was actually visiting a beach in Littleton. He says in regards to his actions that day, quote, It kept coming to my head. I couldn't think why. It's a place Kirsty and I used to take the dog. On odd occasions, I would go down there by myself. His car, a Holden Kingswood, was said to have been spotted in Ashburton that day, including near a local hotel. Search and rescue volunteers recall that Sid vomited while out searching for Kirsty, claiming a migraine, but some wondered if it was out of guilt. Members of his extended family, however, state that he must have been ashamed to have been partaking in alcohol on such a tragic day and therefore may have lied about his whereabouts. Some also speculate that his car being seen near a hotel could point to the involvement of drugs or possibly prostitution. However, no evidence has been found regarding this. 
Detective Greg Williams, one of the investigators, says he believed that father and son may have worked together in killing Kirsty. He theorizes that Sid may have arrived home around 4 p.m. to find that John had already killed Kirsty, possibly accidentally as a result of a sibling argument. Detective Williams postulates that upon seeing the tragic turn of events, father and son may have put Kirsty's lifeless body into Sid's ute in order for Sid to transport her to Camp Goalie, which was less than a half hour drive from their home, while John may have stayed behind to feign concern over Kirsty's whereabouts. This theory would place Sid near the river where he may have tied up Abby before driving to Camp Goalie to dispose of Kirsty's body, returning home at around 6 p.m. Some investigators thought that Sid and John may have planned on releasing the dog later so that Abby could run back home, but that maybe Sid, in his alcohol-fueled haze, could not remember the exact location of the dog, thus preventing him from doing so. The original detective on this case, John Winter, however, disagrees with this assessment, saying that, quote, there is no evidence whatsoever that satisfied me of their involvement. Kirsty's mom says the police never presented her with any evidence of Sid's innocence, but they also never presented her with any evidence of his guilt. And so the uncertainty lingers, like a heavy fog. In what was met with confusion by some in the community, Kirsty's boyfriend, Graham, was never publicly named a suspect. However, being that he was a minor, it can be surmised that he was privately ruled out without media involvement. Graham was home at 4.30 p.m. as he placed the phone call to John, which is what John says alerted him to Kirstie's absence. Police also considered suspects outside of the family circle. Barry Hepburn, a farmer who also walked his dog in the area and was 52 at the time of the crime, was considered a suspect but is now deceased. He was known to be very strong and physically capable, although his mental capacity, neighbors recall, was that of a child. Most suspiciously, Barry uncharacteristically failed to show up to work the next day, and when he did finally show up, he was clean-shaven with a haircut, not the normal look for the burly and rugged farmer. Also considered a person of interest was a Rakia resident named Charlie Smith. Initially, he was looked upon with suspicion because he had chosen to repaint his car, a Fire Falcon, for seemingly no reason right after Kirstie's disappearance. While this information on its own carries little weight, Charlie was reported by a girlfriend to have drunkenly boasted about his involvement multiple times, although no further information has been released. Also investigated was multiple sightings of a car unfamiliar to the townsfolk of Ashburton. This car may have been present in the area at the time of Kirstie's disappearance. A 1961 Calmer model, last registered in 1993, it was reported to have the license plate number EP9888, and it is of interest to the police because it was seen parked outside of the convenience store in Ashburton, the same one that Kirstie may have also visited that day. Witnesses reported seeing a tall man of European descent in his 20s with a slim build and red hair near the vehicle. A witness recalls that he had a dagger tattoo on his upper left arm. The unique nature of both the vehicle and its owner occupied many police resources, but to no avail. A supervisor of a trailer park located near Rakia recalls seeing a nervous-looking teenage girl alongside a younger-looking man on New Year's Eve. However, no further description was given. A Christchurch woman, who has remained unidentified, made a statement to police regarding her ex-boyfriend, who she says was the suspect in the original investigation back in 1999. She says that on multiple occasions, her ex-boyfriend, while intoxicated, had joked about his own involvement in Kirstie's death. While this was reported, no charges have been filed to date. Another suspect was a man named Russell John Tully, who had lived across the street from Kirstie's family in the early 1990s. Locals said that he was familiar with the area that Abby the dog was tied up in, as he had previously camped there. In 2014, Tully was found guilty of murdering Susan Lee Cleveland and Peggy Noble. He was also found guilty of the attempted murder of Kim Elizabeth Adams, all during the commission of a shooting at the Ashburton Work and Income Office on September 1, 2014. However, in 2018, detectives questioned him in prison and eliminated Russell as a suspect as he had a tight alibi for the time period. In 
Interestingly enough, Detective Greg Merton, who took over the case in 2004, says they have evidence that has not been made public, which indicates what type of offender is involved. But unanswered questions remain. If Kirsty was abducted while out walking her dog by the river, why were her shoes clean? Was she killed by someone known to her? Or was the staging part of a stranger killer's MO? Was the dog lead really switched or was that a misidentification? Was her underwear planted or was it genuine evidence of a sexual assault? And why did the killer leave Abby unharmed? Why tie her up to be found later? Were they afraid she'd run home and alert people to Kirsty's disappearance too soon? Or did they just like dogs? In 2018, investigators confirmed that artifacts from the scene, including the dog leash and Kirsty's underwear, had been submitted for updated forensic analysis. Jill, who divorced Sid in 2000 and later remarried, never stopped searching for answers. John, her only child after Kirsty's death, says that he and his father had a falling out after Jill remarried and Sid chose to treat Jill's new partner with contempt and malice. Jill's ex, Kirsty's father, Sid, a hard drinker and heavy smoker, passed away in 2015, leaving in his will his home to the Ashburton New Life Church and to the Cancer Society notably leaving absolutely nothing to his son. Sill professed his lack of involvement in Kirsty's death all throughout his battle with cancer, but critics point out that when he died in 2015, there was a notable absence of the topic of Kirsty at his funeral. After Sid passed away, Jill, desiring Kirsty's ashes, which were in an urn located at the family home, was shocked to learn from Sid's former neighbor that the memorial grave that had been constructed for Kirsty's remains had been suspiciously dug up and the urn removed. Its whereabouts are still unknown to this day. Kirsty's brother John is now in his mid-40s and has a doctorate in astronomy. Both he and Jill hold out hope for some form of closure. And in the meantime, if the killer is alive, he hopes he's shaking in his boots at the potentiality of new DNA testing and analysis to come. Quote, I just hope the killer is sweating that one day they will be caught says Kirstie's mother Jill in 2018 in reflection on the lack of closure in the death of her daughter. She goes on to say, quote, I don't have a face to hate nor a reason to assess the why. One day, 20 years ago, I waved a happy bye-bye to my girl and then she was gone. There's been nothing to show me what happened. If you have any information regarding the brutal murder of 15-year-old Christy, please contact Ashburton Police. In the 20th century, Los Querindos was a farmhouse located about three kilometers from Parades, a small town of about 8,000 inhabitants, which was 57 kilometers from the city of Seville. The farmhouse was blessed with a good harvest of wheat, barley, sunflowers, and olives. In 1950, Francisco Delgado Duran decided to buy the 400 hectare farmhouse. However, Francisco died on February 19, 1969, in a car accident in Portugal, and the Los Galindos was inherited by his sister. Francisco's sister would later marry the Marquis of Granina, Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba. The Los Galindos was then passed on to Fernandez through his wife. Fernandez would hire his 59-year-old friend, Manuel Zapata, as the foreman of the farmhouse. Zapata, along with his wife, Juana Martin, managed the farmhouse and its operations. There were many people working on the farmhouse, which included temporary laborers, permanent farmhands, and tractor drivers. The farm consisted of a main house for the marquee, a smaller house for the foreman and his wife, and two sheds for storing tools and machines. July 22, 1975, it was one of the hottest summer days on record, with temperatures well over 100 degrees, even in the shade. At around 12 p.m., 27-year-old tractor driver Jose Gonzalez told the errand boy, 36-year-old Antonio Finette, that Zapata had asked him to go to the olive grove and help the farm workers remove weeds. Antonio found it strange as removing weeds was not in his job description. His job was to run errands and deliver food to the workers who were working in the field. 
Moreover, Antonio had been working at the farm for many years, and Zapata would always personally give the orders to him. But Antonio did not think much of it at the time, and left for the Olive Garden, which was about 1.5 kilometers, a little under a mile, from the farmhouse on his motorcycle. Jose also told the other tractor driver, 40-year-old Ramon Parida, that Zapata had asked him to go to the Las Hermanas Spring, located four kilometers, a little under two and a half miles, from the farmhouse, and bring fresh water for the farm. Around 4.30 p.m., Antonio finished his work at the Olive Grove and was heading back towards the farmhouse. While on his way, he noticed a column of black smoke rising from the farmhouse. Thinking that the pile of haystack kept at the farm was on fire, Antonio rushed over. Upon arriving at the house, he parked his motorcycle and noticed that the haystack that was kept in one of the sheds was indeed on fire. He called out for Zapata but could not find him anywhere. He looked around for his wife, Juana, and the tractor driver, Jose, but no one appeared to be at the farmhouse, which he found suspicious. He then made his way towards the haystack and smelled what appeared to be diesel mixed with burning tools and another smell which he could not recognize but which was very unpleasant. He then made his way towards Zapata's house and at the entrance of the home he noticed a trail of blood leading away from the door. He knocked on the door but no one answered. Realizing something was terribly wrong, Antonio got on his motorcycle and rode to the nearest civil guard station to notify them. Corporal Raul Fernandez was the first to arrive at the scene. Several farm workers were already at the scene and were trying to put out the fire. Raul then began to investigate the trail of blood and noticed that another trail of blood was coming from the shed, crossing the small patio, and ended next to Zapata's front door. Raul tried to open the door, but it was locked from the inside. The officers then forced the door open and entered the home. Almost immediately, Zapata's dog came running out from inside the house. The dog had blood splatters all over her body, but was otherwise unharmed. Upon entering the house, they came across a large pool of blood on the floor, leading from the entrance to the corridor. The blood was smeared on the floor in a way that suggested that someone had dragged a body. They followed the trail, which led them to the couple's bedroom door at the back of the house. However, the door was locked with a heavy padlock. Raul took out his pistol and shot the lock three times. Inside the bedroom, the officers witnessed a horrifying sight. Zapata's wife, Juana, was found lying between two beds in a pool of blood. Her face had been completely disfigured. She had been mercilessly beaten on the face with an iron rod taken from the bailer. The murder weapon was found next to her. The house was searched, but nothing else would be found. Meanwhile, the workers and officers were able to control the fire at the shed. Soon, they realized that there was something else in the fire, other than just hay. The officers pulled out the remains of two charred bodies. One body had a severed leg, while the other had a severed head. Many workers speculated that it could be the bodies of Jose Gonzalez, and his wife, Asensión Peralta. Jose was seen driving his SEA T600 towards his home at around 3.15 p.m. that day. A few minutes later, he was seen again driving it towards Los Galiendos, but this time, his wife, Asensión Peralta, was in the passenger seat. However, until an autopsy could be performed, police were not certain of the identities of the body. An autopsy later confirmed the bodies did belong to Jose Gonzalez and his wife. Both had died from blunt force trauma to the head. While investigating the crime scene, an officer noticed another faint trail of blood, this one leading to the driveway of the farmhouse. The officer followed the trail towards a pile of hay next to the driveway. While rummaging through the pile, the officer soon found the body of Ramon Parilla. He had died from a shotgun blast to the chest. He had apparently tried to shield himself with his bare hands. As a result, his hands were completely shattered. Police also inspected Jose Gonzalez's car, which was parked in front of the main gate, and Zapata's shotgun, which was broken into two pieces, was found on the back seat of Gonzalez's car. However, Manuel Zapata was nowhere to be found. The police searched inside as well as outside the farmhouse, but did not find anything. 
Rumors started to circulate that the missing foreman, Zapata, had had an argument with his wife and in a fit of rage had killed her with an iron rod from the bailer. Gossip spread that he possibly had then killed the remaining witnesses and fled the scene. At first, police too believed that the manager had killed the workers and was now on the run. The next day, police issued an arrest warrant for Manuel Zapata. As soon as the news of the murders hit the newspapers, journalists and the general public flocked to the scene. The local police were inexperienced and untrained in murder cases. As a result, the crime scene was not cordoned off or secured, and the farm workers, general public, and journalists had trampled all over what remained. The murder weapon was even touched and moved. It was only after 24 hours that the police from Seville arrived and the crime scene was officially cordoned off. The police interviewed the farm workers as well as local citizens, but no one had seen anything suspicious. However, the mystery would deepen when the foreman, Manuel Zapata, would also be found dead three days later. Three days after the initial murders, on July 25th, 1975, as the investigation continued and authorities were still searching and collecting evidence, they stumbled upon yet another ghastly scene. Police were gathered around the farmhouse when Manuel Zapata's dog began barking repeatedly next to a tree beside a wall located at the back of the farmhouse. An officer checked it out and to the shock and horror of everyone present at the scene, Manuel Zapata's body was found under a pile of hay in an advanced state of decay. An autopsy later revealed that Zapata was also killed by blunt force trauma to his head. He also had three small holes on his back, most likely from a pitchfork. But more importantly, the autopsy revealed that Zapata was the first one to have been killed. That meant Zapata could not have killed the rest of the people and then killed himself, as previously surmised. But what troubled the investigators even more was the fact that the area had already been previously checked thoroughly. In fact, an officer swore that he had even urinated on the very tree next to where the body was found and said he did not see anything there at the time. The most suspicious circumstance surrounding the deaths was the fact that the Marquis of Granina, Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba, and his property manager, Antonio Gutierrez Martin, visited the Los Galiendos and were allowed to stay at the farmhouse on the night of the murders, even though the crime scene was still under investigation. The Marquis rarely ever visited the farmhouse, let alone stayed the night, while the property manager only visited on weekends and never stayed at the farmhouse. Both the Marquis and the property manager were questioned by police. Prior to the murders, the farm workers had reported seeing the property manager, Antonio Gutierrez Martin, at the farm looking for Zapata. He was seen driving his Mercedes 250, which belonged to the Marquis. Antonio told investigators that he indeed had come to the farm on the 22nd, but said that he'd been there because he had brought some watermelons from one of the other Marquis' farms to the workers, as he did not want them to go to waste. He said he spoke to Juana Martin and Jose Gonzalez, but did not see Zapata anywhere. He said he left before 12 p.m. When asked why he was driving the Marquis' car, he said that he had given the car to him because the car needed some maintenance and the Marquis had to go to a funeral on the 21st. So Antonio said that he gave his car, a Renault 4L, to the Marquis for the day so that he could attend the funeral. The Marquis told investigators that he went to the funeral and left for Los Calientos after learning about the murders. He said he stayed at the farmhouse because he had no one to look after the farmhouse. For several weeks, police investigated the case, but with contaminated evidence and a crime scene that was not secured after the initial onslaught, it was becoming a very challenging task. With public and media pressure to find the killer, Within a month, the police would announce that Jose Gonzalez was the murderer. A few years prior, Manuel Zapata's daughter had stayed at the property of Los Galiendos farm. Reportedly, Gonzalez had fallen in love with her. But rumor had it that Zapata did not approve of him, and he later sent his daughter away to Barcelona. She later married another man. 
Reportedly, Gonzalez was quite hurt by this turn of events, but would later move on emotionally. Gonzalez would later marry Asuncion Peralta Montero in December of 1974, but police theorized that he may have still held resentment towards Zapata and his wife. Police theorized that at around 1 p.m. on July 22nd, Gonzalez may have been working in the shed on the baler, which had been broken for some time, when Zapata came in and may have reprimanded him for taking too long to fix the baler. Investigators theorized that all of the pent-up anger and resentment over the failed relationship finally took over Gonzalez, and they say he may have hit the foreman in the head with an iron rod from the baler, knocking him unconscious. Detectives then theorized that Gonzalez may have repeatedly hit Zapata in the head, which resulted in his death. Investigators think that he may have dragged Zapata's bodies to the back of the farm and hid it under the hay where it was later found. They think that he may have then walked to the foreman's house and killed Juana with the same iron rod. Police wonder if Gonzalez immediately went to the shed after, and when Ramon Perilla came back from his work to the farm, he may have called out for Zapata, but did not hear anything. Detectives theorize that Ramon Perilla then went to the shed, but upon opening the door, he may have found Gonzalez standing there, pointing a shotgun directly at him. They say Perilla probably tried to shield himself from the shotgun with his arms, and as a result, his arms were severely injured. In pain, detectives wonder if Perilla had then run for his life towards the foreman's house, knocking and screaming at the door. But possibly realizing too late that no one was home, he may have run towards the main gate. They say that Gonzalez may have caught up with him and shot him in the chest. The arresting affidavit stated that Gonzalez, upon realizing the horrific nature of the crimes he had just committed, thought that he needed an alibi to hide his guilt. And who better a victim to throw off the police's tracks than his own wife? He then put the shotgun in the backseat of the car, investigators say, and drove to his home. Detectives theorize that he may have told his wife that Juana had been in an accident and asked her to assist her in her injuries. The officers say he then took her to the farm, but after finding out about the murders, the couple may have had an argument in which Gonzalez then probably murdered his own wife as well. Police believe that Gonzalez dragged his wife's body to the shed and doused it with gasoline and then set it on fire. Gonzalez then probably accidentally caught on fire himself or may have committed suicide by dousing his own body in gasoline and setting himself on fire. When Gonzalez's body was found, he had on his waist a cartridge belt with 16 gauge cartridges. Police believe he may have taken from these bullets to shoot Parilla. The case was closed by the Martina court, naming the deceased Gonzalez as the killer. Without any further evidence besides the circumstantial findings detailed in the officer's statement. However, Gonzalez's family does not believe this theory. They say Gonzalez was a morally upstanding man and that it would not be in his nature to commit such acts. They also point out that his wife was pregnant at the time and they had no problems in their marriage. It did not make sense that Gonzalez would wake up one day, they say, and decide to kill everyone. Moreover, the most clear scientific evidence surrounding the innocence of Gonzalez lays in the fact that he died from blunt force trauma to the head. If he was killed in a manner from such an injury, it is almost an impossibility that he committed suicide. For years, the official explanation raised many doubts, but it was still the only possible explanation, government officials said, which was provided by the police and published in the media. As a result, Gonzalez's family was often harassed by locals and viewed as pariahs. Then, in January of 1981, the case would be reopened after a new judge took over the Martina court. The judge was not convinced by the explanation given by police. The judge read the 600-page report on the case and saw some oddities. First was Finette, who was the first person to arrive on the scene. He had been questioned by police numerous times and maintained that he did not see anyone at the crime scene. However, when a journalist wanted to interview him, Finette later refused, stating that the lieutenant colonel of the Civil Guard had forbidden him to talk about the murders to anyone. 
Moreover, while investigating Finette, police had found that he had received 500,000 pesetas. This had been distributed to his bank account a few days after the murders. Finette at first claimed that the money he received was from an inheritance. He later changed his story and said that he had actually gotten it from his brother, who was working abroad setting up a bar in town. He would again go on to change his statement numerous times and later said it was from his savings account. He was questioned in 1981, but maintained both his innocence and the fact that he did not see anyone at the crime scene. The second oddity the judge pointed out was that the then mayor of Paradas had received a letter written in February of 1976. The person who wrote the letter claimed that his name was Juan and that he had been hired to kill Manuel Zapata. Juan had then attached a train ticket from 1975 to Zaragoza. He said that he used this to escape. He claims that he wrote the letters because he did not want an innocent man, Jose Gonzalez, to be blamed for the murders. Juan said that he was very sorry for what he had done and that he deserved to be hanged for it. In the letter, he stated that he was paid 10,000 pesetas to kill only Manuel Zapata. He claimed that after reaching the farmhouse, he hesitated in killing Zapata, so the person who hired him instead killed Zapata. Juan then claimed that he was forced by this person to kill Juana Martin. He said after killing her, he helped the other person carry her body to the bedroom, where she was later found. He said Parilla was killed because he arrived early and they did not want to leave any witnesses. He claims that the person he was with had asked Gonzalez to go to town and to bring his wife with him under the pretense of Juana having had an accident and needing some sort of aid. Once the couple arrived and entered the foreman's house, however, both were killed. But there were some inconsistencies in the letter. Juan claimed that Gonzalez and his wife were killed by shotgun, but the autopsy report showed they were killed by blunt force trauma to the head. The police managed to find the post office from where the letter was sent, but nothing came of it. Even though there were some inconsistencies, the letter allowed the judge to reopen the case and conduct a second autopsy. The judge asked Dr. Luis Frontella to conduct the autopsy. Frontella was a reputed forensic expert and was well known for his forensic work in the Alcazar girl's murder. On January 27, 1983, all the bodies were exhumed and Frontella went to work. It took four days to complete the autopsies. Frontella's autopsy reports revealed that Gonzalez was not the killer, but instead a victim. He stated that Gonzalez had died from blunt force trauma to the head and not from suicide. Frontella stated that after Gonzalez died, his arms and legs had been severed from the torso. The killer had done this in order to burn the body faster. It is unknown how this glaring error was not found upon the initial autopsy. Frontella also wrote in his report that he found a piece of lead about three millimeters in Gonzalez's body. Frontella stated that it was very possible Gonzalez did not have a cartridge belt on him before the murder. The doctor claims it was most likely placed on him after his death. It is also possible, the doctor stated, that the lead inside his body did not come from a shotgun shell, but from the cartridges that were placed upon his body overheating and firing the pellets within his body. In the report, Frontella stated that at least two people must have been involved in the killings. One of them must have been tall and strong, while the other may have been smaller and weaker. Manuel Zapata was indeed the first victim, he said. He was hit with a blunt object in the head from behind by the larger man. The doctor says that he was later pricked with a pitchfork while he lay on the ground. Juana Martin was the next victim and was killed by an iron rod from the bailer found in the home. He believes that the smaller person probably killed her as Juana had received many hits to the head, suggesting that the killer had to inflict multiple blows as he lacked the physical strength to kill her with just one or two hits. The doctor theorizes that the killer then dragged her body to the larger man who came to help her move the body to the bedroom after killing Zapata himself. The report details that there were two iron rods found inside the house. The one that was found next to Juana was actually used to kill Manuel Zapata, while the other that was used to kill Juana was found in another room. 
Asuncion, Gonzalez's wife, was probably killed inside the house, as police found blood on the bed next to Juana's body that did not belong to either Juana or Zapata. She also had cuts on her body, and her head had been severed, most likely in order to burn her body faster. Frontella could not determine where Gonzalez was killed, but said that he was most likely killed by the same weapon used to kill his wife. The doctor theorizes that the killer then proceeded to mutilate their bodies in the shed in order to burn them faster, but were interrupted by Perilla's voice calling for Zapata. After not hearing from anyone, Perilla decided to check the shed. The doctor says it was then that he was shot immediately. The first shot injured his hand severely. He ran towards the foreman's house, but it was locked. He then ran towards the main gate, but was caught and shot in the chest. Perilla was the last victim, and after that, the doctor said, the killers left in a hurry after setting Gonzalez and his wife on fire. In 1986, a woman came forward and told the police that her husband had told her on his deathbed that he had seen a man running away from the direction of Los Calientos on the day of the murders. The man was known in Paradas by his nickname and had been wearing a military uniform which had bloodstains on it. On his deathbed, this man confessed that he also noticed that the man he saw was carrying a large roll of cash and was mumbling, quote, so much blood, so much death, only for this? The man referenced was later arrested and investigated, but denied knowing anything about the murders. With no actual evidence linking him to the crime, he was released shortly after. In 1978, an author by the name of Alfonso Grosso published a book entitled Los Invitados, in which he theorized that Los Galiendos was involved in growing and distributing marijuana to a Moroccan criminal organization and that all five victims had known about it. He suggested that they were killed after having an argument with the Moroccan criminal regarding the marijuana grow. Authorities considered the possibility, but a search of the farm found no traces that cannabis had been grown. The other theory was provided by the Marquis himself. He said that just before the murders, he had allowed a few members of a legion to stay at the Los Galiendos farmhouse for a night. He said that one of the legion members may have had a stash of drugs with him, which he may have forgotten at the farmhouse. He says that the members left for the Sueta the next day but he believes they could have returned to get the stash back, but might have not been able to find it. He believed that Gonzalez had probably found it and kept it to show Zapata. Upon returning to the farmhouse, he wonders if they'd ask Gonzalez to return the drug stash to them, but he refused. Meanwhile, the foreman Zapata arrived to find the members harassing Gonzalez regarding the drugs. An argument may have broken out between the members and Zapata, the members may have hit Zapata in the head and asked Gonzalez to go to his home and bring back the drugs. He wonders if Gonzalez, for some reason, brought Ascension back with him, and the members then killed them and the other victims in order to leave no witnesses. The police investigated this and found that while members of the Legion had stayed the night at Los Caliendos, all the members had returned back to Ceuta a few days before the murders. Over the years, there have been several other theories, but none were ever confirmed. The last theory put forward was that the Marquis and the property manager themselves were involved in something very shady at the farmhouse. Zapata found out about it and may have decided to tell the old owner, the Marquis's wife. The Marquis may have then hired a hitman to kill Zapata, and after arriving at the farmhouse, after a heated argument, Zapata may have been killed. They then kill the other victims to leave no witnesses. There have been no official suspects in the case, and it has remained unsolved for more than 42 years. Juliana Campo Verde was born on August 21, 1993, in Quito, Ecuador, and was described as a loving and caring girl. In addition to being an outstanding student academically, Juliana was passionate about incorporating music into her everyday life, 
as demonstrated by one instance when she elected to accompany her cousin Lorena to a hospital where upon waking up from surgery, Lorena was in immense pain. Juliana comforted her by singing her a local lullaby in their native tongue. However, things would not remain so idyllic as in 2003, at the age of 10, Juliana and her family made the choice to leave their long-attended evangelical church, and their departure was said to be on unfriendly terms. Her family started attending Oasis de Esperanza. Oasis de Esperanza was an evangelical church close to their home in the Biloxi neighborhood of Quito, and as Juliana was only 10 years old, she would begin attending the youth sessions run by the church and headed by Pastor Jonathan. The church was established in the year 2000. Run by the Querido family, Jonathan Querido was one of its pastors. Juliana was passionate about her new church. Being a member of its choir, Juliana took great pride in her congregation. Juliana consistently and passionately attended meetings and lectures held by Pastor Jonathan. Juliana's mother recalls that her angelic daughter went practically everywhere with the founders of the church, eventually becoming close friends with Jonathan as well as his extended family. Jonathan, his brothers, and Juliana would frequently go out to eat and she would walk with them in public. The girl, having not even seen the change of 13 years, was already joining the Querido family in their intimate Christmas festivities. Their frequent group chats via instant messenger did not alarm her mother, at least not in any media reports of the later incident. Juliana was known to take Pastor Jonathan's word as gospel, literally, and with all her heart she would listen to what he had to say with eagerness and passion. The pastors of their church, however, made sure to keep a careful eye on their parishioners. Jonathan's father, Pastor Patricio, expected to be asked for his approval prior to any members, including Juliana's family, engaging in their own projects or simply taking a trip. In some cases, if the parishioners did not pay the tithe, they would put pressure on their members in order to give some money. Sometimes, members of the church even went to the parishioners' places of work in order to warn them that they would not receive any blessings if they did not pay the tithe. Church leaders would blame any illness or ailments that their members had on their lack of payment, and if the parishioners deigned to go on a personal vacation, or even simply got a new job, they would receive phone calls from the pastors asking why the elders had not been informed. By 2010, although Juliana and her family were able to tolerate this church, it was starting to make them more and more uncomfortable as the local pastors at the church started using their authority to tell the now 16-year-old Juliana who her life partner was destined to be. Her discomfort was not eased by the fact that she had already found herself a boyfriend named Fabian, who she kept hidden from the church. When the elders found out, however, they expelled Juliana from the church choir. Pastor Jonathan, rather than calling this a punishment, instead described her expulsion from the church choir as, quote, a time of rest so that she can stabilize. This deeply affected Juliana, who would frequently cry alone in her room, believing that she had failed Pastor Jonathan and her church. Eventually, though, Juliana was allowed back into the choir. In December of 2011, Juliana received a Facebook friend request from a man identifying himself as a church psychologist. He introduced himself as Juan Solano. Juliana accepted the friend request and the two began to talk via instant messenger. Juan would ask deeply personal questions about Juliana's romantic life, her interests, if she ever had any sexual partners, and about her future plans. When Juliana stated that she hoped to leave Ecuador in the future and begin studying abroad in Argentina, Juan Solano was very much opposed to the idea and convinced her, via instant messenger, to not go, stating that in going to Argentina, she would be losing valuable time with her friends and family. Juliana told Juan, quote, there are sacrifices that are better to not live through, to which Juan responded, be careful, you can get burned. The two continued their digital conversation, with Juan revealing that he was a widower and that his wife had shared Juliana's name. 
Juan then started asking Juliana about Pastor Jonathan and why she had not been talking to him. When Juliana explained her actions and the issues that Jonathan had had with her boyfriends, Juan was quick to rush to the pastor's defense, justifying his reactions and describing him as, quote, a wounded lion who, quote, would give his life for his sheep. Juliana thanked Juan for his advice and stated that God had put him in her path to help her. Juliana, however, would later notice Juan's profile pic and she would send him a single message, stating, quote, you look a lot like Jonathan. Juan never responded to the similarities, but later sent another message to Juliana in which he suddenly told her that she should marry Jonathan's brother. The next time Juliana went to church, she asked Jonathan about this, and he said he would pray and find out if that was true. Coincidentally, and very conveniently, Jonathan told her that this was indeed divine intervention and that she was destined to marry his brother. Juliana was devastated as she did not want to marry Jonathan's brother and was still in a relationship with Fabian. According to Fabian, she stated that she told him, quote, in the church, they had a revelation that I have to marry someone and that I cannot disobey God. Not long after, Juliana and Fabian would break up. In the coming months, the pastors would continue to pressure Juliana into marrying Israel Carrillo, Jonathan's brother telling her to go out with him and to give him a chance. But Juliana felt nothing towards Israel and questioned why God would tell her to marry someone that she did not even know. When she expressed her doubts with Jonathan, he complained that she was not taking her role in this seriously. And when she asked what her role was, Jonathan responded, quote, obedient daughter to be Israel's wife, what he has for me. Juliana would beg Pastor Jonathan to let her date Fabian, but this was rejected, citing that Fabian was not a member of the church and older than she. In February of 2012, Juliana, still deeply in love with Fabian despite her commitment to her faith, was crying in her room one day when her mother overheard and asked her what was wrong. Juliana finally confessed to her mother what had been going on between her and Pastor Jonathan. When her mother found out what had happened, she was not pleased that Pastor Jonathan was forcing Juliana into a match that she did not want. And after reassuring Juliana that nobody was forcing her to get married, her family would leave the church in June of 2012. That same month, Juliana again would start dating Fabian. On July 7, 2012, 18-year-old Juliana had just graduated from high school and was saving up money for college. She, alongside her parents, purchased a small shop where she sold health food products. On this day, she and her mother were getting ready to start work. They had breakfast together and then headed out for their jobs. Both walked together from their home to Mariscal Sucre Avenue. On their way to their jobs, they happened to come across Jonathan. They awkwardly greeted him from afar before continuing on their way. However, Juliana's mother thought to herself how very odd it was to come across Pastor Jonathan, as he lived in the northern center of Quito and his church was currently closed due to the early morning hour. The meeting was understandably tense and Juliana was nervous and uncomfortable throughout, recalls her mother. The two arrived at a gas station located at the intersection of Mariscal Sucre Avenue and Avahi Avenue. At this point, they went their separate ways. Juliana had to walk five more blocks to reach the shop while her mother took a bus to go to her job. This would be the last time that Juliana was seen alive. 20 minutes later, her mother received a phone call from her husband asking about Juliana. He stated that he had called her on her cell phone, but that strangely, on the other end, he only heard the sound of children playing and in the background, the voice of an adult male telling the children to put the phone down as it did not belong to them. In response, her mother called Fabian and he stated that he had not seen Juliana and that he was supposed to meet her that night. Her mother started calling hospitals, clinics, friends, and members of their new church. However, nobody had seen Juliana. Her mother attempted to call Pastor Jonathan and confront him. However, he never answered the phone. 
Juliana's family searched the neighborhood and visited various hospitals in case Juliana had been in an accident and was somehow unidentified. However, they were unable to locate her. Eventually, Juliana's mother went to the police, and the response that she got from them was not what she was hoping for. The police acted dismissively, stating that they had to wait 48 hours before filing a report, and came up with callous explanations, stating that, quote, she must have gone on a rampage. They also theorized that she may be pregnant and would be back nine months later, or that she was simply with her boyfriend and that the family should wait for her to return. After the disappointing police response, her mother would continue to search on her own, constantly calling Juliana's cell phone, only to get no answer. Eventually, she received a text message, supposedly from Juliana, which read as follows, quote, I met a person and I'm going with him as soon as I can. I'll send you the stuff from the shop. Her mother went to see Fabian, and once she saw that Juliana wasn't with him, she showed him the message, telling him that this was not how her daughter would have written or acted. Both went to the police again, only to be met with the same inaction. As the police stated that the text message proved that Juliana had left voluntarily, despite her mother's protests that she did not send the text. The police simply told Juliana's mother again to wait until the daughter returned. Defeated, she returned home and searched Juliana's room, trying to find a note, a message, or anything that would indicate where she might have gone, but she was unable to find anything. The next morning, her mother went to the health food store that they owned to find everything intact and nothing out of place. Even the grapes that were purchased the prior day and money from the purchase was still in the safe. Both Fabian and Juliana's parents returned to the police. However, they continued to drag their feet on the issue, stating that she was likely with her boyfriend. When Fabian told the officer that he was her boyfriend, they simply said, quote, then surely she has another one. Eventually, despite the police's lack of interest, they managed to file a missing persons report. However, Hopes for progress were still faint, as a prosecutor would not be able to be assigned to the case until Monday. When the family tried going to the media over the weekend, the media seemed just as disinterested. Eventually, the family had to resort to creating and posting their own missing persons posters in the Biloxi neighborhood. It was while she and Mary Goth, Juliana's aunt, were posting flyers that a police officer seemingly unaware of his colleague's disinterest in this case, approached her and informed her that the neighborhood did have CCTV cameras. He offered to take the women to the Quito police headquarters in order to see if they could view the footage. Once they arrived, the officers at the Quito police headquarters would only allow Juliana's mother to come inside and view the footage. So she went inside while Juliana's aunt waited for her outside. While outside, Juliana's aunt called Pastor Patricio Carrillo, Jonathan's father, to tell him that Juliana had disappeared, and he reacted incredibly oddly. His response was, quote, I already knew that. I had already seen what was going to happen. Why are they leaving the church? He then asked Juliana's aunt where they were at the moment, and when she replied that they were at Quito Police Headquarters, Patricio did not seem to like the answer, and told the woman that they should not try looking for Juliana at a police station, and instead should go to Ecuador's borders with Peru and Colombia, Cuenca or Ambato. When Margoth asked why Juliana would be in any of these places, or why she would not want to be found, Patricio responded by saying, quote, why are you doubting me? If you want to take me to jail, take me away at once. It seemed he did not want them to be at the Quinto police headquarters or to see the CCTV footage. Much to the disappointment of Juliana's family, the CCTV footage did not seem to reveal much of anything. The next day, the prosecutor was finally handed the missing person report and they assigned an investigator to the case. While the family was telling the investigator what had happened, Juliana's aunt received another call from Pastor Patricio. He told them that he had prayed for them extensively and that due to his prayer, they would actually hear from Juliana in 20 to 30 minutes. Immediately afterwards, Juliana's mother received a text message claiming to be from Juliana, which said, quote, 
I'm fine. I'm in Cuenca. As soon as I know the address, I'll let you know. I don't have internet. The investigator, who was present when this happened, advised that they answer and call her to tell her that they were looking for her with the police. When they did call her cell phone, however, it was turned off and they could not contact her. They never received any further text messages. The investigator never suggested triangulating the transmission in order to see where the text was sent, and so the family was left with more questions than answers. Jonathan's sister, Michelle, soon called Juliana's mother and said that her daughter had posted a Facebook status that said, quote, Thank you, friends, for your concerns. I made my own decisions, and I want you to respect them. Do not interfere in my life. Juliana's mother refused to believe that this was true and still found it suspicious that all the information about Juliana had come from Pastor Jonathan's family. Knowing her daughter's password, she attempted to log into her Facebook, only to find out that the password had been changed quite recently. A friend of Fabian's helped the family break into Juliana's Facebook account, and that was when they found the Facebook conversation that Juliana had had with the church psychologist, Juan Solano, back in December of 2011. Juliana's family read that in the last month, Juan Solano had sent a message which told Juliana not to leave the church, that her family belonged there, and that her mother was being selfish. He went on to say that, quote, people who leave the church die, and that her heart was, quote, leading her to the biggest mistake of her life, and that she and Fabian destroyed, quote, what was prepared for her. Juan had also sent a threatening proverb, which said, quote, then they will call me, and I will not answer. They will look for me in the morning, and they will not find me, because they hated wisdom and did not choose the fear of the Lord. To Juliana's mother, this was very similar to how Jonathan spoke, and just like Juliana did half a year prior, she noticed that the profile picture resembled Jonathan as well. On July 11th, Juliana's mother went to police with these text messages in hand and asked the prosecutor to get a call log from Juliana's cell phone. She also requested that the IP addresses that had sent the text messages be traced and requested that they question Jonathan and the Calido family. The prosecutor agreed and did in fact question Jonathan and his family. They spoke ill of Juliana and her mother, calling them problematic and accusing them of having issues and domestic troubles. They also claimed that Juliana was hanging out with the wrong crowd. Jonathan, when asked why he was in the same area as Juliana on the day she was last seen, stated that he had just finished cleaning the church and later left to go to Patricio's house. He later, however, changed his story and said that he had actually gone to work at the National Institute of Meritocracy, where he was a systems engineer. Despite how suspicious they were acting, the prosecutor decided not to continue the investigation, stating that since he was also an evangelical, he'd have to ask his own pastor for permission to investigate another church family. He also stated that he was confident the Querido family was not responsible because they were pastors. The reluctance to investigate the pastors meant that the phone records and call logs were unable to be saved in time. On August 14th, even though the prosecutor had already ended the conversation, Pastor Jonathan went to the prosecutor's office to tell his version of events. He stated that on July 9th, Juliana had entered his office at the Meritocracy Institute unannounced in order to supposedly tell him that she was fine and just with friends. He then alleges that Juliana asked him as a pastor to keep her presence a secret, and despite him not being of the Catholic faith, and thus not bound to silence if anyone confesses something, Pastor Jonathan kept this information a secret. He went on to allege that Juliana then asked Jonathan if she could use his computer in order to post a Facebook status, and he claims that the girl promised she'd return home soon. Jonathan also admitted to the prosecutor that he had created the fictitious account of Juan Solano with the purpose of, quote, advising her or to suggest positive changes in her life as Pastor Jonathan said that he saw Juliana was going through what he called multiple problems. Jonathan denied ever trying to pressure Juliana to marry his brother, 
and instead claims that he simply suggested that she meet with him to see if they could have a, quote, more serious relationship. When the prosecutor asked him if he had used this counseling technique with anybody else in his flock, he responded by saying that he had not. The prosecutor took his statement and sent him on his way, taking no further action. It took two years until there were any new developments in the case. But in 2014, Juliana's mother was finally able to get the IP addresses from where the text messages were sent that were supposedly from Juliana. Juliana's mother, much to her surprise, found that the text messages were sent from Jonathan's computer. As a result of this information, on May 18th, 2014, the investigation into Juliana's disappearance was reopened and an organized search was finally conducted. With the police finally searching a valley in Quito and a revive in Guangopalo, as Pastor Patricio had lived in that area. The police also raided Jonathan's house and seized all of his electronic equipment, such as his computer and his cell phones. While they found no evidence that Jonathan or Patricio had abducted Juliana, they discovered large amounts of pornographic images, in addition to photos and videos of Juliana and other girls from the church saved on his computer. Police then went to the Meritocracy Institute to check Jonathan's statement that he had given two years prior. The Institute luckily still had their guest book from 2012 saved and it showed that there were no records of Juliana visiting the premises and none of Jonathan's co-workers recalled seeing her that day. Investigators also discovered that the clock-ins and clock-outs on the day that Juliana disappeared was doctored. They had been physically altered to make the start and end time of Jonathan's shift that day unknown. Throughout the interrogation, it was reminded to Jonathan that there are no seals of secrecy in evangelism, unlike in Catholicism. So Jonathan instead opted to use his civilian right to remain silent. It was after this revelation that the case was finally starting to be taken seriously by authorities. And while the first prosecutor had refused to investigate any further due to his own religious beliefs, he was replaced at the family's request. However, going forward, there would not be one single prosecutor assigned to the case, but a variety of prosecutors, which led to administrative errors. From 2002 to 2017, 10 different prosecutors were assigned to the case and due to their administrative actions, they were constantly being switched around and replaced. Eight different investigators were assigned by the various prosecutors to investigate and over 90 different legal files were created. During the extensive investigation, numerous pieces of circumstantial evidence against Jonathan were discovered, but nothing could be conclusively tied to him or the crime. Prior to the realization that the IP addresses that sent Juliana's texts were from Jonathan's computers, a psychiatric evaluation was performed on Pastor Jonathan on September 16, 2013, and this examination had alarming results. When Jonathan was made to talk about the disappearance, the psychiatrist noted that he seemed highly agitated and nervous and that he, quote, expresses discomfort, tries to have the appearance of spontaneity and ease. The emotional tension manifested is clearly observed with the trembling of his hands and jaw, ticks in his mouth, and his way of avoiding visual contact. In addition, according to the report, the pastor contradicted himself numerous times. In one version, he described Juliana as the daughter of a dysfunctional family, but in another, he described her as a calm and consistent young woman in the church. The criminal profile generated by the psychiatrist portrayed Pastor Jonathan in a less than virtuous light. The profile indicated that Jonathan was frustrated and upset at Juliana's decisions and that he had a misogynistic outlook on the world. It also said that he was plagued by obsessive thoughts and the psychiatrist is quoted as saying in his report, that Jonathan had, quote, instrumentalized a series of acts on Juliana Campo Verde, similar to those used by any coercive sect or cult. 
the person conducting the evaluation ended their report by stating that it was highly likely that Jonathan was responsible for Juliana's disappearance. In 2017, the police, using the IMEI code, were able to determine that Jonathan had been using Juliana's cell phone chip in his own phone in order to make a call to an operator and to review voice messages. They also determined that he was the one sending every single text message to Juliana's family. Despite the copious amounts of technological evidence against Pastor Jonathan, combined with the many amounts of circumstantial evidence at the time, the current prosecutor stated that the investigation could not move forward as there was no body. In January of 2018, the family requested that the prosecutor be replaced. So the Attorney General's office agreed and decided that this time they would make sure to choose their prosecutor carefully. They chose Myra Soria to be the 11th prosecutor. She was chosen due to Myra's history of prosecuting gender-based crimes, particularly female homicides in Ecuador. They also believed that Myra was far more sympathetic to the family and more determined to see justice carried out than any of the prior prosecutors. Myra asked Clero, a Brazilian-Mexican telecom company which operates in Ecuador, for their registry, but they no longer had possession of it on file as their system had automatically deleted it after a certain amount of time in order to free up space. Instead, Myra requested a second search warrant for Jonathan's home, and on September 5th, 2018, the police searched the pastor's home for a second time, this time finding the smoking gun. They seized a folder, and when opened, its contents revealed that Jonathan had requested a record of his phone calls back in 2012. The document that he requested lists the numbers that he had called during this time and the duration of each call, and it had the IMEI number attached to it. With that in mind, Myra went back to Clero and asked if the IMEI and data from Jonathan's phone were correct, and Clero confirmed that it was. So, Myra requested from Clero a call log of Juliana's cell phone and found that her last call had been made the day of her disappearance and had come from Jonathan's IMEI number. Upon seizing his computer, they found that he would frequently search up things such as, quote, dead woman found in Quito and other similar search queries. They also found that in 2012, Jonathan had been searching about scopolamine and how to prepare it. In addition, 500 gigabytes of pornography was found on his computer, the computer of a supposedly pious man who would often lecture the community on the evils of temptation. After Jonathan was arrested, he was taken to the Flagrencia unit in Quito, where his family and Juliana's parents both waited anxiously to see if the police would believe Jonathan's version of events and release him yet again. Pastor Patricio was present and he seemed restless and nervous, pacing back and forth across the room with his hands behind his back, only occasionally stopping to talk to his family or check on the time. At one point, Pastor Patricio stopped to stare at Juliana's mother, who tried her best to stare back at him with defiance and courage. The county prosecutor interrogated Jonathan for four hours and asked him 98 questions, with most questions being focused around his relationship and history with Juliana. Jonathan continuously gave contradictory information and when asked why Juliana's SIM card was registered to the IMEI of his phone, he only replied, quote, I don't know and stated that on the day of her disappearance, he had stayed at the Meritocracy Institute until 8 p.m. He was unable to provide a satisfactory explanation behind the connection of Juliana's SIM card to his phone number, and his behavior and actions indicated guilt to all present. Ultimately, the police and Myra, the prosecutor, did not believe him, and thus, on that same day, he was brought to court to finally be arraigned on charges of kidnapping. The judge thought that there was enough evidence to move forward and officially charged Jonathan with kidnapping. The prosecutor requested that he be held in pretrial detention, a request which the judge granted. 
the prosecutor soon gave a press conference, and it became a media sensation overnight. Throughout Ecuador, the case was heavily discussed. At a press conference, Juliana's parents thanked the prosecutor Mayra and the police for their efforts. Elsewhere, however, Pastor Jonathan was denying the charges, and his family was professing his innocence, calling his arrest religious persecution. However, due to the reputation garnished by the press conference, Jonathan's family's church, Oasis de Esperanza, suffered and their numbers diminished, with very few of its parishioners attending mass and instead attending different churches. This angered Jonathan's family as it ultimately affected their bottom line, their wallets. While he was kept in pretrial detention, the authorities would continue to interrogate Jonathan until eventually the pressure built up and he finally confessed. On November 10th, 2018, he admitted that he had kidnapped Juliana, but that she had died accidentally during a fall and that he had disposed of her body at a ravine in the Bella Vista neighborhood. Due to this confession, a major search operation would be conducted the following day with Juliana's family and Jonathan, under police guard, taking part. Numerous officers, search dogs, and even an excavator were employed in the operation, utilizing 400 officers and investigators. However, while they descended down to the bed of the ravine and traveled several kilometers along the banks of the Machangara River, no evidence of Juliana was uncovered. Finally, on November 11th, those involved in the search discovered human remains in a field near the ravine, exactly where Jonathan said they would be found. However, the remains were not a complete set, with the police finding only a tooth, a jawbone, and a rib. Despite the low quantity of remains, there was still more than enough evidence in order to get a DNA sample. This DNA sample would be compared to Juliana's family. Meanwhile, the prosecutor would work on upgrading the charges against Jonathan from kidnapping to the offense of kidnapping resulting in death, which would carry a harsher sentence. On November 27th, the DNA results came back, and shockingly, they ended up not being a match for Juliana. Coincidentally, it appeared that the skeletal remains of an entirely different person were in the exact spot that Jonathan said Juliana would be. To this day, the remains have never been identified, and police could not determine the age of the skeleton, the cause of death, or even the gender. Investigators were also unable to compare the teeth for identification, as they could not locate Juliana's dental records. On November 30th, the charges against Jonathan were revised, and he was charged with kidnapping resulting in death, even with the absence of Juliana's body. Although the remains did not match Juliana, they still had Jonathan's confession. However, after the search, Jonathan again exercised his right to silence and refused to speak to investigators. Due to the extensive investigation, Jonathan's family had seen the writing on the wall, and Patricio and Israel, his father and brother, quickly fled Ecuador before the prosecution could call them to testify or possibly charge them as well. On December 28th, an arrest warrant was issued for the two even though the prosecutor believed that the two likely fled to the United States. The whereabouts of Pastor Patricio in Israel are unknown to this day. On December 21st, the prosecution requested permission from a judge to excavate Jonathan's garden and search his home for forensic evidence. This request was granted and police began to dig up Jonathan's yard in order to search for Juliana's remains while forensic technicians examined the inside of his house via the use of luminol. The luminol, when sprayed, detected traces of blood in Jonathan's bathroom. The excavation of Jonathan's yard turned up no results, and there's no mention of blood samples matching Juliana, so it is assumed that they were not a match. On July 3rd, 2019, Jonathan's trial would finally commence. The defense's main argument was that the only crime Jonathan was guilty of was kidnapping and that despite his confession, any evidence of him committing murder was all circumstantial due to the lack of a body. While the defense claimed that no body meant no crime, Myra, the prosecutor, argued that Jonathan was directly responsible for Juliana's death and sought the maximum sentence. 
She further requested that Juliana's family be paid the equivalent of $262,800 in compensation and that the Oasis de Esperanza Church be shut down and that the sentence be communicated throughout the evangelical organizations so that a crime like this would not be repeated. The prosecutor argued that although Jonathan was not a fully ordained pastor, he used his position of power in a religious organization in order to manipulate Juliana who was deeply religious. The prosecutor also advocated for a registry of pastors to be created in order to have their ordination regularized. Although no body had been found, the first witness to be called to the stand was Luis Hueco, a forensic and medical examiner. The forensic examiner was questioned in regards to Jonathan's pretrial confession, which read, quote, I defended myself to prevent her from continuing to attack me. I took her hands and then I took her arm. I put my hands on her shoulder. I squeezed her neck. And in that struggle, after taking a step back, she fell, giving herself a hard blow to the head, after which she did not move. Jonathan stated that this happened in his driveway and the medical examiner was asked if this version of events was possible. He stated that the possibility of a woman weighing 143 pounds or 65 kilograms, which was Juliana's weight, dying instantly from a fall such as the one that Jonathan described would not be medically probable. The medical examiner argued that if Juliana had fallen backwards and had suffered brain damage as a result of the fall, that she would have died days later and not instantly as Jonathan claimed. The medical examiner argued that if Juliana had been pushed or had been strangled, such an injury could result in a compound fracture to the skull. However, this would not have been the result of an accidental fall. Juliana's mother, Elizabeth Rodriguez, was another witness for the prosecution. She told the court about Jonathan's manipulative tactics and stockish behavior. She detailed how his family would repeatedly contact her in an attempt to disrupt or mislead the ensuing investigation and search, including how Jonathan's father called Juliana's aunt to tell her that 20 to 30 minutes from that conversation, she would hear from the missing Juliana, and how they later received a text purported to be from Juliana stating she was fine. It was only later in the investigation that they found out that Jonathan had been using his phone to send those text messages and that Juliana had not only not been fine, but that she was already deceased by that time. The next witness called was Italo Rojas, who had performed the psychiatric evaluation on Jonathan in 2013. He testified that Juliana was the victim of psychological manipulation and that Jonathan had used her faith against her. He also testified that Jonathan, using the fake name of Juan Solano, had made Juliana feel guilty for having goals and aspirations outside of his church, and that he had presented himself with a supernatural image, one of great power and of a prophet capable of having visions. The psychiatrist reiterated his opinion that the Oasis de Esperanza church was more like a cult than an actual church, and that Juliana had fallen victim. He also added that he believed Jonathan to have a, quote, hidden sexual desire, for Juliana. Based on his search history leading up to and after Juliana's disappearance, coupled with his prior questionable relationship with Juliana, the prosecution argued that on July 7, 2012, Jonathan had approached Juliana alone and had drugged her with scopolamine before putting her into his vehicle and taking her to a motel where he may have attempted to have sex with her before killing her, possibly during an argument. The prosecution also called a telephone analyst to the stand, who testified that Juliana and Jonathan's cell phones were both in the same area at the same time, and that their triangulation coincided with four different points, with it being likely that the last point was when Jonathan put Juliana's SIM card into his own phone. The defense questioned the validity of the text messages between Juliana and Juan Solano, and during cross-examination with Italio Rojas, the defense asked how he knew Jonathan was the one behind the Juan Solano account, to which the psychiatrist answered that Jonathan's wife and Jonathan himself back in 2012 had confirmed that it was. 
The defense also asked the expert if Jonathan had ever verbally threatened Juliana in person, to which Italio Rojas responded that he had not heard of any instances of him threatening her in person. The defense pointed out that the chats were obtained via result of the family utilizing one of Fabian's friends in order to break into her Facebook account and therefore question the accuracy of the messages. The defense also stated that they had over 400 witnesses, but in the end, they only called four to the stand. One of the men called to the stand was Pastor Vicente Munoz, who was the national representative of the Foursquare Gospel Church, to which the Oasis de Esperanza, and by extension Jonathan and his family, belonged. He testified that he had only ever authorized Patricio Carrillo and his wife as pastors and that he had never authorized any assistant pastors for the church. In regards to the supposed protection that Jonathan may have had as a pastor, the prosecution asked about the supposed seal of the confessional, as Jonathan years earlier had cited that as his refusal to testify. Vicente testified that the Foursquare Church did not have confidentiality for their confessions or their pastors. On July 17, 2019, Three judges, after five hours, reached a decision and found Jonathan Carrillo guilty of kidnapping resulting in death and sentenced him to 25 years imprisonment. They ordered that Jonathan pay Juliana's family the equivalent of 100,000 American dollars in compensation and suggested that a national registry of pastors be established. They also ordered that Oasis de Esperanza close its doors forever. While Juliana's body was never found, after seven long years, her family was finally able to see justice. As part of the court agreement, the police are to continue searching until Juliana's body is found. Jonathan appealed his sentence, but on March 13, 2020, the provincial court rejected his appeal and added to the compensation agreement with the court, ordering that the Foursquare Gospel Community Church fund the construction of a memorial plaque at the old church location, which Jonathan used to claim to be pastor of. After this appeal, Jonathan again appealed his case, this time to Ecuador's Supreme Court. On November 16, 2020, they too rejected his appeal, which meant that Jonathan had exhausted all of his appeal routes and would remain imprisoned until his sentence was served. Due to the court order stating that the search for Juliana's body be continued indefinitely, regular meetings are scheduled to discuss where to search for next and how to further continue the search. On April 15, 2021, another massive search operation was conducted utilizing search dogs and hundreds of officers, police combed across the same area that Jonathan had originally mentioned in his confession. The search lasted for three hours, with police teams carrying out a sweep on a steep slope of the ravine in Bella Vista. And while they marked six points separated by about 50 meters each, using dogs trained to look for human remains, intensive investigation would uncover no further evidence. The most recent search was carried out in November of 2021, but was not met with any results. So far, Juliana's body has not been found. The identity, gender, age, and cause of death of the remains found during the November 2018 search, as well as the whereabouts of Patricio and Israel Carrillo, remain unknown. July 7, 2022 marked the 10th anniversary of Juliana's disappearance and likely murder. Leticia Sexuba was a 33-year-old single woman living in Fréjus dans le Var, a picturesque town in southern France known for its lush scenery and plush beaches. Born on September 11, 1979, her parents Claude and Carmen recall that she would eagerly participate in any sport and would often be seen playing volleyball or swimming when not judiciously attending to her studies. When Leticia was 18 years old, she had an acute episode of paranoia, resulting in hospitalization. While the young woman underwent professional treatment and eventually was deemed fully recovered by her doctors, in 2009 she again experienced another episode of paranoia, this time due to sleep deprivation and stress, doctors said. She received treatment for this and was advised to regularly consult with a psychiatrist. 
Fortunately, she returned to her normal state and her previous life. In 2012, Leticia left her position as a police officer, which she had held for just one year, and began working at La Poste, a commercial mail service. Leticia at the time had a boyfriend, a military soldier whom she had been dating for about a year. In September of 2012, right around when she should have been joyously celebrating her 33rd birthday, Leticia found out that her boyfriend was married and lived with his wife in Fréjus. Rattled, Leticia immediately called off her relationship with the man, but she was not without internal struggle. On September 15th, 2012, the man's wife left an angry and aggressive voicemail for Leticia, demanding that she end her relationship with her husband and cease all contact. While she initially had broken up with the family man turned philanderer, she told those closest to her she was unfortunately still in love with him and would resume seeing the military man, this time in secret. On September 24th, 2012, Leticia received a phone call from one of her friends, and while talking, she informed them that she would be spending time with a friend named Nora, along with who she said was Nora's boyfriend. However, the identity of this couple remains unknown, as family and friends interviewed say they are not familiar with anybody named Nora. The next day, on September 25th, 2012, at around 7 p.m., Leticia went to the train station to pick up her friend Corinne, who was returning from a trip. Leticia asked to spend the evening with Corinne, but she told her she was too tired from the trip and simply wanted to go home and rest. Leticia then dropped her friend off at her house and went back home. Later, Colleen told police that Leticia appeared to be acting normal and that there was nothing unusual about her conduct. This would be the last time Leticia was ever seen alive again by her loved ones. After arriving home from dropping off her friend, Leticia called her grandmother at around 7.30 p.m., on the call, she expressed her desire to spend some time with her and to stay overnight at her house as she found she had an opening in her schedule. She informed her grandmother that she planned to arrive at around 8 p.m. Her grandmother lived approximately 40 minutes away in Piminad. Leticia often visited her grandmother and stayed the night, so she may have stated it would only take her 30 minutes as she was familiar with the route. Leticia got into her black Volkswagen Polo and left her home. She would never make it to her grandmother's. Leticia's grandmother became worried when her granddaughter, usually prompt, failed to arrive. She attempted to contact her multiple times to no avail. Concerned, she contacted Leticia's parents and her sister, Christel, who were away on vacation. Though Christel had tried calling her cell phone, she was also unable to reach her sister. Despite this, she suggested to their concerned grandmother that Leticia may have decided to stay home after all, or may have met up with friends. The following day, Cristal, now alarmed herself, contacted her sister Leticia's workplace, discovering that she had not shown up for work for the past two days. Cristal then contacted Leticia's boyfriend to inquire if he had any information regarding her whereabouts. However, he informed Leticia's sister that he had not seen nor spoken to the now thought to be missing 33-year-old. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, Cristal asked their aunt to report Leticia as officially missing while their parents rushed back to France from their vacation. Police immediately launched the search for the missing woman. Subsequently, they received information that her Volkswagen Polo had been found in the town of Bordeguera, located in the neighboring country of Italy, 120 kilometers from her home. However, while her car had been located, Leticia was nowhere to be found. Her family was taken aback by the discovery, as Leticia had never been to that area before, nor did she express desire to travel to Italy. Given that she had traveled to her grandmother's home numerous times in the past, it was deemed unlikely that she had forgotten the way. During their investigation, the police were able to create a timeline regarding Leticia's movements after leaving her home on September 25th in order to visit her grandmother. It was found that at 8.36 p.m., half an hour after Leticia told her grandmother she thought she would be arriving, Leticia called her boyfriend, a fact that he had originally withheld from Cristel when she called pleading for any information. 
Police interrogated the man, already caught by his wife for cheating and now possibly suspected of a far greater crime. But he told police that while he had in fact had a brief conversation with the missing 33-year-old, they had not argued, nor did he know her location. While he was unable to explain why he neglected to tell Leticia's sister this information, the man swore to police that the two had not been in conflict. He claimed Leticia sounded distressed and repeatedly uttered the phrase, quote, I'm lost, I'm lost. It is unclear if the man is considered a suspect. However, media reports say he did supposedly have an airtight alibi. Police were able to surmise that roughly one hour after Leticia phoned her boyfriend, at around 9.50 p.m., a motorist called the police and reported that a car, later positively identified as Leticia's black Volkswagen Polo, was driving the wrong direction on the highway, situated in the vicinity of Bordeguerra, Italy. In order to stop the car, police decided to put up a roadblock at the exit of the Bordeguerra highway. However, Leticia did not stop for the roadblock, instead swerving around it and driving away. Police say after this blatant circumventing of the law, the now missing woman abandoned her car in front of a gate of a holiday resort called Baia La Rota by the beach of Bordeguera. CCTV footage captured Leticia sprinting towards the access gate, which led directly to the resort's secluded beach. She scaled the gate and then ran alongside the shore before disappearing from the camera's view. Although police say that... Due to the low quality of the footage, it is difficult to ascertain if the person in the video is even indeed Leticia. At 10.30 p.m., a police officer found her abandoned car. The car was locked, but the headlights were still on. Inside the car, police found Leticia's identity card and her mobile phone. The overnight bag containing Leticia's clothes, which she had brought along to spend the night at her grandmother's house, was discovered laying on the ground near the resort's gate. Local detectives conducted a search of the residence, but found nothing. Police believe that Leticia may have drowned, and therefore they conducted maritime searches. Authorities believe that there was a 99% possibility of finding her body if she had drowned, as the sea that day was calm and the waters shallow. However, the search and rescue divers came up empty-handed. Leticia's parents... Cloud and Carmen Sexuba, as well as her sister, Clistel, spent the next month in Italy searching for their missing loved one, putting up missing flyers around the area, and questioning locals. However, to no avail. One and a half months later, in November of 2012, Leticia's family found a flip-flop that they believe belonged to the missing woman. It was found in the same area where her overnight bag of clothes was left. The sandal was mysteriously in perfect condition, and some believe it had been placed there more recently than the search and rescue operations. Nine months later, a 70-year-old woman who was staying at a house next to the resort told Leticia's parents that on September 25th, around 10 p.m., she had seen a mysterious man on the same path, the one that ran next to the resort, outward toward the sea. She described the man as tall and dressed in a suit. Leticia's parents hired a private investigator. They also contacted psychics to help them find their daughter, but found no new leads. Leticia remains missing to this day. If you have any information on the whereabouts or fate of Leticia, please contact 04-94-51-9062. That's 0 cat. 94-51-90-62. Michel Ballanger and Jean-Louis Turcon met each other while studying at Maison Alfort Veterinary School. The two would immediately fall in love and would get married in 1973. In April of 1983, Michel gave birth to a boy and the couple would name him Charles Edouard Turcon. Charles Edouard was a quiet boy who loved animals. The family lived in a large, luxurious house in Nice, France. At 7.15 a.m. on March 21, 1991, Jean-Louis contacted the central police station in Nice to report that his eight-year-old son, Charles Edouard, was missing. Police arrived at the house and questioned Jean. He said that his son had gone to bed around 9 p.m. the previous night, while he had gone to bed at 10 p.m., 
The worried father claimed that when he woke up that morning, he could not find Charles in his bed. He said that he searched all over the large house, but was unable to find him. He told police that they both slept in the same room, in twin beds. Jean-Louis reported that he did not remember Charles Edouard waking up that night, although he did say the eight-year-old was known to use the restroom without waking him, as he was perfectly capable of doing it himself. Police conducted a search of the house and called in sniffing dogs to assist in the search. The dogs were able to pick up a scent in the house, but the trail ended outside the front door. Police believe that Charles was picked up in a car from the front door. Investigators ruled out the possibility of the eight-year-old voluntarily running away due to his shy personality. The child had regular therapy sessions for nervous tics and his intense fear of being in the dark, as well as a deep fear of being alone or near strangers. Moreover, all of the child's personal belongings were discovered at the house, an indication that he did not run away in the way that some children are apt to do after an argument. The father told police that nothing different had occurred the night prior to Charles Edouard going missing. Police then looked into the personal life of his parents. They questioned Jean about his wife, who did not appear to be home. Jean told police that his wife, Michelle, had been living separately from them alongside a friend for more than a month. It was found that the couple had had a turbulent marriage. Michelle accused Jean of having violent and controlling behaviors. She informed police that Jean was a disturbed individual who derived pleasure from exerting his dominance over others. She recounted to investigators how Jean allowed their family dog to eat Charles' favorite pet chicken alive in the garden, and how he would callously shoot down the neighbor's pigeons, whom his son loved so much, with his long rifle, a 22 caliber. Michelle even told police that, in an effort to stop prematurity in intimate moments, Jean-Louis performed a self-circumcision in his own veterinary clinic. Jean-Louis had a history of extramarital affairs with women that he found through the classified ads. He would go on to have affairs with an Italian lawyer, a Swiss mother, and countless others. Shockingly, he would even invite these women to accompany him and his son on vacation or on ski trips. Michel also had extramarital relations with a few men that Jean was privy to. Jean-Louis often questioned whether Charles Edouard was even his own biological child. The couple would have regular fights, which affected their son's already fragile mental state. During one of these fights in January of 1991, Michel confessed to Jean-Louis that he was too old and that she no longer was in love with him. She also finally disclosed to him that he was not the biological father of Charles Edouard. Jean said that he always knew at the back of his mind that Charles was not his biological son, but after receiving confirmation from his wife, he ordered a paternity test just to be sure. In February of 1991, the DNA results came in and it was confirmed that Jean-Louis Turcon was not the father of Charles Edouard. According to Michel, Moïse Berli d'Estain, a Jewish man born in Czechoslovakia working as a ballet dancer at the Nice Opera House, was actually the biological father. When Michel had found out about the pregnancy as a result of an extramarital affair, she had wanted to get an abortion. However, due to Jean-Louis' strict Catholic upbringing, he prohibited her from doing so, all the while being unaware that the child was not his own. Following this revelation, the couple had a violent altercation in which Jean-Louis sprayed Michel with tear gas. After that fight, Michel decided to leave the marital home for good. In February of 1991, she moved out of the home and initiated divorce proceedings. Jean-Louis refused to engage in joint custody, nor would he pay alimony. After Michel left him, Jean-Louis would harass her, sending threatening letters. When this did not work, he gave her an ultimatum to return home by the 20th of March, at midnight. Their son would go on to disappear that exact night. Michelle told police that she was convinced her husband had something to do with Charles Edouard's disappearance. She then began recording their conversations from that point on. On April 25th, 1991, Michelle met with Jean for a cup of coffee, in which he claimed that he had sent the boy to Morocco and that he would get him to return if she would come back home. 
In order to get a confession out of him and desperate to see her son again, Michelle returned to his home and was intimate with him in exchange for information. During the interlude, which was anything but romantic, Jean-Louis disclosed how he had actually taken their son while he slept, had strangled him, and then had buried him under a cross in the mountains above Nice. While Michelle told investigators about Jean-Louis' clear confession, they told her to get the confession recorded on a tape. So, on March 6, 1991, Michelle again was intimate with Jean-Louis and this time recorded his confession on a tape recorder that she'd placed under the bed. On May 13, 1991, police arrested Jean-Louis and charged him with Charles Edouard's murder. The police searched the area where the father claimed to have buried the child's body. However, they found nothing. Jean-Louis spent the next nine months in jail before being released on bail on February 14, 1992, pending his trial, which was not scheduled until 1994. After getting out of jail, he offered 100,000 francs in reward for anyone who could provide information about his son. He then hired a private investigator and sent him to Israel to investigate. He claimed that his wife had actually given the child to his biological father, whose family lived in Israel. To support this allegation, one month after Charles had Edouard's disappearance, Michelle had converted to Judaism and began to learn Hebrew. She informed her friends and family that she was going to England, however, she made multiple trips to Israel. Following this information, Jean-Louis' trial was postponed. The investigator who had gone to Israel found two witnesses who claimed that they had seen the eight-year-old with his mother in August of 1993 when he came in for a haircut. Michel admitted that she had been to Israel as part of her conversion to Judaism, but denied knowing anything about her son. At the time, she was studying at a university and her classmates say they do not recall seeing her with a child. On December 24, 1993, Charles Edouard's biological father, Moïse Berhe d'Elstin, was found drowned in the old port of Nice. Jean-Louis' trial took place on March 17, 1997. His lawyers accused Michel of kidnapping Charles Edouard and taking him with her to Israel. They presented the two witnesses, who claimed that they had seen the boy with Michel in Israel. Nevertheless, the witnesses failed to provide accurate details, such as the boy's perceived age and physical description, leading the judge to deem their testimony unreliable. Jean-Louis denied killing his son and claimed that the confession on the recording was a form of a role-playing game that Michel insisted he perform in order for them to be intimate. However, the court chose not to believe him. Based on Jean's confession, the court sentenced him to 20 years in prison for the murder of his son. In 1999, a private investigator hired by Jean-Louis claimed to have found a boy resembling Charles Edouard, who was born in Nice, who was currently living in Israel. He secretly videotaped the boy and submitted it to the court. However, the video was blurry and it was impossible to make out whether or not it was the eight-year-old. Jean-Louis appealed his conviction, but it was rejected. In 2003, a prisoner alleged that a fellow inmate had admitted to committing burglary near Nice the night that Charles went missing. The man who confessed allegedly claimed that while speeding away from the scene, he encountered a child dressed in pajamas and a robe crossing the street alone. The witness says that the man told him he hit the child with his vehicle and killed him. The witness says he then claimed that he burned the body in a cement factory, but the prisoner was found to be seeking a reduced sentence in exchange for sharing more information and his testimony was deemed unreliable. Jean-Louis would get remarried in prison to a woman named Nadine. He was released from prison in 2006 and moved to Saint-Martin in the West Indies with his second wife. In 2017, upon arriving home, Nadine discovered Jean-Louis lying on the floor with two gunshot wounds in his back. At first, it was believed to be a botched burglary. However, Nadine was arrested and imprisoned for the murder of her husband after police found traces of gunshot residue on her hands. Nonetheless, Nadine had a solid alibi. She had been at a restaurant, publicly celebrating her birthday alongside three friends at the time of her husband's murder. In court, an expert confirmed that it was possible the gunshot powder may have been transferred to Nadine's hands after she touched her husband. In 2020, Nadine was exonerated. 
Jean-Louis' murder remains unsolved to this day, and despite a number of leads over the years, Charles Edouard still remains missing. September 15, 1981 started out like any other autumn day in the quiet town of Etching, Germany. Like all the children in the area, it was Ursula Hermann's first day of primary school, and the year ahead was filled with the promise of fun and friends for the 10-year-old child. With light hair and bangs wisping over her light eyes, Ursula's older brother, Michael, recalls her liveliness as a child. He also fondly points out how Ursula's passion for life was also paired with an innate caution and sense of maturity. He wistfully remembers how Ursula was slightly more sensitive and mature than the other children in her elementary grades, and that she would sometimes get frustrated when her classmates would misbehave or act out in a repetitive manner that was not conducive to the school's learning environment. On September 15, 1981, 10-year-old Ursula Herman attended her first day of secondary school and returned to her house. She had two older brothers and an older sister. Her father was a teacher and her mother was a housewife. In the afternoon, Ursula practiced piano with her brother Michael, as they often did together. At 5 p.m., she rode her bicycle to the nearby village of Schoendorf, where she attended her regularly scheduled gymnastics class alongside her cousin. The village of Schoendorf is about three kilometers, just under two miles, away from the village of Esching, with a spruce forest running between the two towns. The forest is popular among hunters, joggers, and mountain bikers, and is known locally as Weingarten. After finishing their gymnastics class, Ursula decided to go back to her cousin's home in Schoendorf, which was a mere 10-minute bicycle ride from her own home in Esching. The two girls played and ate dinner together. At around 7.15 p.m., Ursula's mother called her sister, Ursula's aunt, to tell Ursula to come back home as it was already getting dark. Ursula left her cousin's home at around 7.20 p.m., cycling through the spruce forest, However, she never arrived back home. Half an hour later, when she still had not returned, her mother called Ursula's aunt again, this time inquiring as to her daughter's estimated time of arrival. Her aunt, now worried, told her that Ursula had left 25 minutes prior and that she should have reached home by now. The family immediately knew something was wrong and acted of their own accord to find the 10-year-old girl, along with calling police. Ursula's father and her uncle quickly went into the nearby spruce forest to look for her. Ursula's father walked from Esching to Schorndorf, while her uncle walked from Schorndorf to Esching. They both called out Ursula's name repeatedly throughout their converging paths, but she could not be found. Within an hour, the spruce-filled forest was crawling with police, neighbors, firefighters, and scent-detecting dogs, all searching for Ursula. Ursula would have taken the path that was right next to the Amersey Lake in order to get home. She was well familiar with the path and had ridden her bike through the forest many times. The journey should have only taken her 10 minutes, as it had in the past. The search parties combed all around the path, but a rain had already begun falling steadily, and with the weather and pitch black darkness, it was becoming very difficult for the searchers to look in the thick undergrowth. At around 11.15 p.m., a scent detecting dog led police from the lake into the brush. About 20 meters away from the path, police located Ursula's red bicycle lying on the ground. However, Ursula was nowhere to be found. The police searched throughout the night, and at the break of dawn, the search was intensified. Dozens of police officers joined in and scoured the dense forest, while a helicopter searched from above. As police boats and divers were called in to search the lake, rescuers became more and more alarmed. There was no trace of the 10-year-old. On September 17, 1981, 36 hours from the time that the 10-year-old went missing, Ursula's family received a morbidly mysterious phone call. Ursula's father picked up the phone and said hello, but no one answered. The caller on the other end was completely silent. 
Then, a few seconds later, a popular radio jingle played for three seconds. Then, another moment of silence. After which, the radio jingle played again before the caller hung up the phone. The jingle was recognized by the parents as the jingle that was used for the traffic bulletin on the Bayon 3 radio station. Over the next few hours, three more similar cryptic calls were made to Ursula's home. The police then started recording these calls, but no one knew what they meant. The day after the cryptic and unclear calls of unknown origin were made, Ursula's home received an envelope marked urgent. Inside the envelope was a ransom note written with words cut out from the newspaper. The note was written in broken German and translated said, We have kidnapped your daughter. If you ever want to see your daughter alive again, then pay two million Deutschmarks ransom. The note also said that if the Hermans agreed to the ransom demand, then they should confirm it on the phone after the jingle played. In an unforeseen error, which could only be attributed to post office delays, the kidnappers had expected the note to be delivered one day earlier. The note ended with, if you call the police or do not pay, we will kill your daughter. That afternoon, the kidnappers called again, and this time Ursula's mother, now possessing the necessary context with which to understand the directions, quickly agreed to pay the ransom after the jingle played. Her mother then asked the caller for proof that Ursula was alive, and asked, quote, what are Ursula's two soft toys called? But the caller remained silent. Ursula's mother then yelled, quote, talk to me, say something, something from Ursula. But the caller hung up the phone. The Hermans were not very well off, and raising the ransom money was difficult. Thankfully, a neighbor raised some of the money, and the local government agreed to pay the rest. On the 21st of September, the Hermans received another note, this time containing instructions for the transfer of the ransom money. The note asked the family to pay in used 100 Deutschmark bills packed into a suitcase. Ursula's father was to deliver the ransom money alone and drive a yellow Fiat 600 no faster than 90 kilometers an hour, which was about 56 miles per hour. This was odd considering the Fiat 600 was rarely found in Germany at the time. The note said to wait for further instructions on the date and the location of the dropping of the ransom. The family waited patiently for further instructions, but they would never receive any letters or phone calls ever again. Two weeks later, after not having heard anything from the two kidnappers, the police decided to search the forest again. More than 100 police officers scoured the forest with 10 scent-sniffing dogs. The forest was divided into grids, and the police searched every grid one by one using metal rods to search the forest floor. 19 days after Ursula went missing, on October 4, 1981, at 9.30 a.m., an officer stumbled upon a clearing. When he poked the ground with his metal rod, he struck something beneath the forest floor. He shouted and notified other officers in the vicinity. The officers carefully began to dig in the ground. Soon, they discovered a brown blanket. After removing the blanket, they found a wooden board which appeared to be a lid to a box. They removed the wooden board to find another board beneath it. This board was painted green and was 72 centimeters in length and 60 centimeters in width. The police tried to remove it, but it was bolted down with seven sliding bolts. The officers pried it open and looked inside. To the dismay of all parties involved, inside the box lay Ursula's cold and lifeless body. The officers themselves cried as they carried her body out of the box to be examined by the mortician. Two police officers delivered the Hermans the tragic news. The grieving parents asked if Ursula had been physically tortured beyond her confinement prior to her death. The officers at the time could not answer that, but an autopsy later confirmed that Ursula had not been hurt before her death. It stated that Ursula had likely died within 30 minutes to five hours after initially being buried. It is believed that she had been drugged, possibly with nitrous oxide, and then put in the box, as there was no sign of a struggle or any kind of movement in the box. The coroner determined that Ursula likely suffocated to death due to lack of oxygen in the crudely created and improperly vented burial box.
Looking inside the box, the police determined that the kidnappers had intended on keeping their hostage alive. The box was 139 centimeters high and was buried in an upright position, like a phone booth. It had a seat with a hole in it, which doubled as a toilet seat, and a bucket with water was placed underneath. Opposite the seat was a shelf, which served as a desk. Sitting on top the shelf was a small portable radio, tuned to Byron 3, the same station which broadcast the jingle that played on the ransom phone call. The box contained three bottles of water, 12 cans of Fanta, six large chocolate bars, four packets of biscuits, an apple juice, two packs of chewing gum, and a portable light. The kidnappers had also left 21 books, including comics of Donald Duck, romance novels, thrillers, and westerns. The box was fitted with elaborate ventilation tubes made from plastic plumbing pipes, which extended to ground level. However, the person who designed the box did not realize that an air pump would have been needed to circulate the air. Without the pump, oxygen would be exhausted in the box, as without forced movement, the air in the box would simply be composed of carbon dioxide, the waste product of breathing out, which would result in a low percentage of oxygen, causing death via asphyxiation. When Ursula's body was found by investigators, she was sitting on the makeshift seat with her head tilted backwards and her eyes closed. A jogging suit in a plastic bag was placed on her lap. It is believed that more than one kidnapper was involved, as the box weighed around 60 kilograms and would have been impossible for one individual to carry alone in the forest. The investigators supposed that the kidnappers must have known the area well, as they had chosen an area which was deep in the forest and very remote. The kidnappers had also tried to camouflage the area by placing five small spruce trees around as a makeshift barrier. The police were only able to find one single fingerprint on a piece of tape in the box. The police searched the area for any clues or footprints, but as the crime scene was not closed off initially, press reporters and members of the public had trampled the area, losing any valuable footprints or evidence that could have been recovered. During their search of the area, police found a bell wire strung through the trees placed next to the lakeside path. Thinking that it probably belonged to the children who played in the forest, the police left it as is. Later, it was thought that possibly the bell wire was placed there to alert the kidnapper or kidnappers that a potential victim was in the vicinity. Understandably, the people living in Ashing and nearby villages were shaken after hearing the news. Parents were afraid to leave their kids alone. The case was highly covered in the media to the point that numerous reporters showed up at Ursula's funeral. The reporters even harassed the distraught family. Ursula's brother, Michael, knocked a camera on the ground after a cameraman held it in his face at his own sister's funeral. The police interviewed family and friends and issued a reward of 30,000 Deutschmarks for anyone who could provide any information that could lead to the arrest of the kidnapper or kidnappers. Soon, police received hundreds of tips from the general public. Many of those leads pointed to one individual in particular, Mr. Werner Marzurek. Marzurek was 31 years old and a trained car mechanic. He lived just a few hundred meters from Ursula's home and was married with two children. He was tall, strongly built, and known to be short-tempered. It was also found that he had a mounting debt of over 140,000 Deutschmarks. A week after Ursula's body was found, Marzurek was questioned by police, and initially he was not able to provide an alibi. But a day later, he would tell investigators that he was playing a board game with his wife and two friends at the time of Ursula's disappearance. Police searched his home, but were unable to find anything. A month later, they compared his fingerprints to the fingerprint found on the piece of tape at the crime scene. However, the prints did not match. Police still were not convinced of his innocence, though, and in January of 1982, he was again arrested, along with two of his friends. He was interrogated for several days, but was eventually released without any charges. A month later, Klaus Fafinger, an acquaintance of Mazurek, was interrogated. Klaus was an unemployed mechanic. 
He was brought in for questioning after his landlord told police that he had seen him driving on his moped with a spade tied to the side a few weeks before Ursula's disappearance. Klaus initially claimed he was innocent, but on the second day of questioning, Klaus confessed that he had dug a hole for Mazurek in September of 1981. He had dug this hole in the forest after Marzurek had promised to pay him 1,000 Deutschmarks and to give him color television. He also claimed to have seen the box being buried in that hole. The police then asked Klaus to lead them to the burial site in the forest, but he wasn't able to locate the site. He did not even know the directions to it. He would later retract his confession and was subsequently released without any charges. In 1982, two students from a nearby boarding school came forward with the bell wire that the police had found one year prior. The students told investigators that eight months after Ursula's disappearance, they'd come across the wire while chasing an owl through the forest. They took it down and kept it with them in their dormitory in a locked box. The police theorized that the wire was used as an alarm system during Ursula's disappearance. They theorized that one kidnapper was on the lookout, and after seeing a potential victim, he would alert the other through a light-up bulb, or perhaps a buzzer at the other end of the wire. Later, the forensics team would also find the impression of a mathematical probability tree on the paper of one of the ransom notes, suggesting that the kidnappers may have been students or younger people. One additional factor supporting this idea was the fact that the main character of one of the comic books that was left in the box drove a Fiat 600, the car that the kidnappers told Ursula's father to drive in the directions which were left in the ransom note, which suggested that the kidnapper may have read the comic book. Over the years, investigators would follow up on several leads, but nothing came of them. The case would eventually grow cold. In 2004, police reopened the case. They studied each and every clue and went over each and every suspect, trying to find any new leads. With advancements in DNA technology abundant, they were able to build a DNA profile from a screw on the box. In 2007, a DNA database found a potential match. The DNA matched a suspect who had brutally beaten a rich woman, Charlotte Bullinger, to death in a Munich penthouse. The suspect was Charlotte's own nephew, a 33-year-old man. During the trial, the nephew of Charlotte was eliminated as a suspect in Ursula's kidnapping, as the suspect would have only been seven to eight years old in 1981. The nephew was, however, already sentenced to life in prison for the commission of his own aunt's murder. And it is a baffling mystery to this day how the DNA taken from the screw on the box matched the nephew's. Some wondered if there had been contamination of the sample itself, perhaps from the lab processing it. Others speculated that it may have been an error in genetic profiling data. Ursula's kidnapping was not considered a murder under German law, as the kidnappers had not intended to kill her intentionally. Because of this, her case was considered a kidnapping with accidental death, which had a statute of limitations of 30 years. This meant that the police had only four more years before the perpetrators could no longer be held accountable. The prosecutors then decided to take another look at the original suspects in 1981, Klaus Pfeffinger and Werner Mazurek. Klaus was already dead, but Mazurek was still alive. Following 2007, the police started monitoring Mazurek. They tapped his phone and even deployed an undercover agent to befriend him. Later that year, his house was searched and a DNA sample was taken from him. However, the DNA sample did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. Among the items police recovered from Mazurik's home was an old tape recorder. Police claimed that it was the tape recorder used to play the jingle during the ransom phone calls in 1981. A sound expert was consulted and was given the original recordings of the jingle from 1981. The expert spent the next few months analyzing the recordings and conducting tests on the tape recorder. 
He claimed that the tape recorder had a technical defect which led the sound to be distorted. He said this was similar to the recording of the jingle from 1981. Therefore, he concluded that the tape recorder was most likely the recorder used by the kidnapper to play the jingle. On May 28, 2008, police arrested Mazurik and charged him with Ursula's kidnapping. Mazurik's trial took place in 2009. Ursula's parents did not attend the trial as they did not want to go through the pain of facing the terrible details of their daughter's death. Ursula's older brother, Michael, attended the trial. Mazurik pleaded not guilty. The bulk of the evidence against Mazurik was circumstantial. The prosecutors argued that Mazurik had the motivation as he needed money and was a repairman who could have easily built the box. They also pointed out that he had a criminal record for fraud and forgery. The prosecutors also presented the story about a dog that Mazurik had killed in 1974. Reportedly, in 1974, the dog had littered rubbish from the dustbin onto the kitchen floor. Mazurik then grabbed the dog and locked it in the basement freezer. His wife had claimed that when she went to get some meat from the freezer, she saw the dog, who had perished to death. Mazurik later said that he had punished the dog with, quote, exile in Siberia. However, the most important evidence the prosecutors produced that helped them convict Mazurik hinged on two somewhat controversial pieces of evidence. First was the sound expert's statement about the tape recorder. When asked, Mazurik said that he had bought the tape recorder only a few weeks prior to his home being searched. He claimed he purchased it at a flea market. However, he was not able to prove who sold it to him and no one at the market could recall if the tape recorder was actually sold there. The second piece of controversial evidence was Klaus's confession. The prosecutors believed that it was credible and that Klaus deliberately failed to locate the burial site so as to mislead the investigators so that they would release him. They pointed out that Klaus had accurately given details of the crime scene from the size of the box to the description of the burial site. In 2010, all of the prosecutor's arguments convinced the jury and Mazurik was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. His wife was also on trial for being an accomplice but was acquitted due to lack of evidence. Well, everyone was glad that the case was finally solved and that the perpetrator was behind bars, Ursula's brother was not convinced of Mazurik's guilt. Prior to the trial, Michael had been given access to the case files and he read through all 6,000 pages over the next few weeks. Michael could not understand why Klaus's confession was treated as credible. Klaus was a known alcoholic and had claimed to have experienced hallucinations while in custody. Moreover, he pointed out that Klaus could have easily learned about the details of the crime scene from the media as the case was highly covered. Klaus had also been interviewed several times by police after his confession, and he had changed his story several times. According to Klaus's ex-wife, Klaus was extremely lazy, and she doesn't think that he would have agreed to dig a hole in the forest. His DNA also did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. Most importantly, Klaus's confession was not signed, and investigators had written it down from memory a few weeks after the interview. Michael was also not satisfied with the sound expert statement on the tape recorder. Michael had some expertise in sound as he was a music teacher, and he could not understand how the tape recorder could conclusively be linked to the phone calls. Since the court was not willing to re-examine the case, Michael came up with a plan. In 2013, Michael filed a civil claim against Mazurik for 20,000 euros under the basis that Mazurik had caused him tinnitus as a result of psychological trauma from the case and the subsequent trial. Michael had hoped that this would force the court to re-examine the case as Mazurik would claim he was wrongfully convicted and was not liable for the damages. But in August of 2018, the court ordered Mazurik to pay 7,000 euros for causing Michael's tinnitus and stuck to the verdict that Mazurik was guilty. 
The trial has taken a toll on Michael. His health deteriorated, his career has also taken a hit, and he is separated from his wife. But he cannot give up his pursuit of finding out the truth. Michael is still working on getting a retrial. In a letter to the court, he had said, quote, I'm not convinced of his guilt, but neither am I convinced of his innocence. The case is officially closed, but it is still not confirmed who truly kidnapped Ursula on that fateful day in 1981. Bamber Bridge is an urban village in Lancashire, England, just five kilometers from Preston. In 1979, the village had a population of around 10,000 people. Living in this small town was a 14-year-old boy named Alan Livesey. Alan was the youngest of his two siblings, Derek and Janet. He lived with his parents, Bob and Margaret Livesey, in number 41, The Crescent. The Crescent was a cluster of homes lined up in a semicircle off of Collins Street in Bamber Bridge. Everybody knew everyone else in the area and crime was almost non-existent. However, in 1979, this relatively quiet village was witness to a horrific murder, which shocked the people living in and around Lancashire for decades to come. On the 22nd of February, 1979, Alan's father, Bob Livesey, left for his night shift at a nearby business called Leyland Motors. Alan had his evening meal at around 6.30 p.m. His mother, Margaret Livesey, ventured out around 8.50 p.m. in order to meet up with a friend, Marianne Walker, for a drink at the Queen's Hotel pub. Unbeknownst to her husband, Margaret was also meeting up with a man at the bar with whom she'd been secretly having an affair. Not much is known of what happened that night, but what is known is that 14-year-old Alan was home alone from 8.50 p.m. onwards. He had been grounded by his parents for taking a car and crashing it. He had apparently done this in a protest for not being allowed to go out to a youth disco with his friends. Around 11 p.m., Margaret was dropped off by her secret lover, Frank Bamber, at the top of Collins Road North. She was walking down the road towards her house when she noticed two young boys lurking around on the street next to Mrs. Matthews' house, number 63. She recognized the two adolescents. They were Andrew Matthews and Tommy Rogers. She knew that the two teenagers, residents of the Crescent, had been getting in trouble with the police as of recent, and their shenanigans had included her own son, Alan, who had recently been in trouble for illegally driving and damaging various automobiles. Alan's mother also believed that he had been involved with shoplifting. Margaret knew that the two teenagers should not have been out at that time of night, so she decided to let Mrs. Matthews know that her son, Andrew, was outside their home. Upon seeing Margaret, the two boys ran away. Nonetheless, Margaret knocked on Mrs. Matthews' door to let her know about Andrew and found both Mrs. Matthews and Mrs. Rogers, Tommy's mother, in the house having a drink. Mrs. Matthews offered Margaret a drink and the woman sat down to chat. A few minutes later, Mrs. Matthews' older son, Leslie, arrived home. Mrs. Matthews asked Leslie to go outside to find Andrew and Mrs. Rogers' son, Tommy. Leslie went out to look for them but could not find them anywhere and returned home empty-handed. Margaret then asked him to go check on Alan. She reasoned that maybe the boys were with him. Leslie went to the Livesey home and knocked on the door but no one answered. He tried to peek through the window but could not see anyone in the house. However, the TV was on. He went back to his home and told Margaret that no one had answered the door. Margaret thought Alan may have fallen asleep and simply left the TV on. 
She gave Leslie her house keys and asked him to go in and check up on Alan. Leslie headed back to Alan's house and opened the door. As soon as he entered the house, he was met with what he described as a quote, funny smell. He realized the house was filled with gas. He then made his way to the fireplace where he found Alan laying face down on the carpet between the sofa and the fireplace. He was dressed in his youth army uniform and had his hands tied behind his back. Leslie rolled Alan over and realized he was all wet. He noticed a red sock around his neck. As Leslie removed the sock, he saw multiple cuts and gashes around his neck. He was horrified. He tried doing CPR, but nothing positive happened and blood spurted out of the wounds on Alan's neck. Leslie immediately went back to his home and notified Margaret. Both headed back to the home, and after seeing Alan's body, Margaret Livesey dropped to her knees and said, quote, Oh, Alan, oh, Alan. Margaret then tried to close Alan's eyes and said, quote, I don't want him to die with his eyes open. But this attempt was unsuccessful. Leslie tried to open the windows as there was gas throughout the home, but Margaret instructed him to call police immediately. Leslie went to the nearest phone booth and called police. The call was placed at 11.28 p.m. and is the only reliable time check in the entire timeline of the crime. The killer had turned on all the gas taps, but after finding Alan's lifeless body, Margaret promptly turned them off. When the police arrived just three minutes later at 11.31 p.m., the house was full of gas. So all the windows were opened to clear the gas, which resulted in difficulty in estimating the exact time of death for Alan, as when the window was opened, it let cold air into the home. One of the methods used by pathologists in the 1970s in order to determine the time of death was by checking the body temperature. Alan's body had been first subjected to gas and then to cold temperature, which meant that by the time the body was examined at 2.40 p.m., the different temperatures interfered with determining the time of death. During their investigation, police could not find any sign of a struggle. There was no blood spatter on the floor nor on the walls nearby. There was blood on the carpet around the body, but no sign of blood on the furniture nor on the fireplace. If Alan had been attacked while standing, there would have been blood splatter on the wall around the body. Alan's clothing was rumpled, his vest and jersey pushed up towards his chest. This suggested that the killer had sat astride him and possibly had tortured him with the point of a knife before forcefully plunging it into his neck. Six of the stabbings were deep gashes, while the other four were superficial nicks, inflicted by the tip of the knife one of which was a cut upon his eyelid. It seemed that the knife was placed on his eyelid gently and then pressed down with just enough force to cut the skin. The red socks that were found around his neck had multiple cuts on them, suggesting that Alan had it around his neck during the stabbing and was stabbed through the socks. This explained why there were no blood spatters around the body. Alan's wrists had been bound with a necktie. The tie had been looped around both wrists and tied in the middle, bringing the wrists close together. It then went around each wrist individually and tied again. The two ends were then secured by a reef knot. The strangest artifact of the scene, however, was Alan's uniform. His mother told police that Alan had been wearing trousers and a jumper when she left the home around 8.50 p.m., but now he was wearing his army cadet uniform and his new boots. He was a keen army cadet and had joined in 1977. Police did not believe that this was a frenzied murder made in the moment of extreme anger, but that of a vicious game gone terribly wrong. The police searched the front as well as the backyards of all the homes in the Crescent, hoping to find the murder weapon, but to no avail. Police questioned friends and family, as well as neighbors. The neighbors told police that they had heard noises coming from the Livesey's home, but they could not remember the exact time. Neighbors said that Alan had a habit of having other boys in his home whenever he was alone. 
The day after the murder, a witness by the name of Peter Nightingale came forward and told police that on the night of the murder, at around 10 p.m., he had left his friend's house in order to walk to his sister's home. His sister, Susan Warren, was the next door neighbor of the Livesey's. Peter said that as he was climbing the back fence to go to his sister's back garden, he heard the kitchen door of the Livesey's being closed. He then saw a man walking down the back garden pathway, hopping over a fence and disappearing. Peter described the man to be about 5 feet 10 inches tall, with whitish blonde hair which bounced when he walked. Peter believed that the man was probably wearing an anorak as he heard the sound of the material rubbing against his arms. Peter's sister, Susan Warren, who lived next door, was also interviewed by police. Susan said that she did not hear anything during the early part of the evening, but when she was putting her daughter to sleep just before 10 p.m., she heard a voice from Alan's home. She said that it seemed like Alan was fooling around with someone. Later, she heard Margaret shouting, he's bloody dead, when Alan's body was found. Susan Warren's boyfriend, Ronald Mason, was also interviewed. He too stated that he had heard the same noise around 9.55 p.m. He was sure of the timing because he had just finished watching The Streets of San Francisco, a TV series. He described the noise as, quote, various shouts and had believed that Alan was fooling around with somebody. Later, he too heard Margaret's voice when Alan's body was found. With the eyewitness statements, the police initially believed Alan was killed by someone he was hanging around with that night, probably by a friend. Police then visited Alan's school and the local army cadet headquarters in order to interview anybody who may have had knowledge about the murder, but no leads were acquired. Initially, police thought that a young man, around 5 foot 10 inches tall, may have been responsible for the crime. He was described as having white blonde hair and was possibly someone who hung around the LGBT scene. However, a few days later, police completely dropped that theory with no further details given to the media, other than the fact that police were now completely shifting their focus and turning their sights on a new suspect, Alan's own mother. Margaret Livesey. Margaret would become a prime suspect after her two next door neighbors provided additional details, which they had not shared with the police in their initial interviews. Christine Norris was the right side neighbor of Margaret, while Susan Warren was the neighbor on the left. While Susan's home was attached to Margaret's house by the common wall, Christine's house was detached from the Livesey home. Christine was also interviewed by the police early on in the investigation. She had claimed that she had not heard anything that night, except for when the police finally arrived at 11.31 p.m. She did not have much to say, and the police did not even bother to take her written statement at that time. But four days later, Christine talked to Susan and changed her story. In fact, both women changed their stories. Christine now claimed that she had actually heard a violent argument between Alan and his mother at around 10.45 or 10.50 p.m. on the night of the murder. Christine said that she was reading a book until 10.30 p.m. and remembered hearing voices from the Livesey home. She even said that she heard Alan cry out, quote, help me. She also told police that the relationship between mother and son were strained. She said that Margaret would give her son, quote, irritable slaps. She also claimed that the NSPCC had received reports about Margaret's alleged cruelty to Alan. The NSPCC is a child protective service aimed at preventing further child abuse. The agency talked with the boy, but he denied that his mother had hit him and did not show any signs of physical abuse. Christine also alleged that Margaret would lock Alan in his bedroom for hours upon end and that she would see him sliding down the drain pipe in order to get out of the house. When asked why she did not tell the police about this in her earlier interview, she said that she did not want to get involved. However, when she talked to her mother and to Susan Warren, she decided to come forward. Susan Warren would also be re-interviewed and she too changed her story. She repeated her original story, but also said that she had heard Alan and his mother arguing between 10.45 p.m. 
and 10.50 p.m. She also claimed that she had heard Alan's head being banged against the wall. In the second interview, she also corroborated Christine's NSPCC story. Ronald Mason, Susan's boyfriend, stuck to his story throughout the subsequent interviews and said he did not hear Alan nor Margaret fighting that night. On February 27th, five days after Alan's murder, Margaret Livesey was brought to the police station for questioning. She gave the same statement as she had in her previous interview. She said she was dropped off by Frank Bamber at the top of Collins Road North around 11 p.m. and then went to the Matthews home. The police, however, told her that her neighbors had heard her arguing with Alan at 10.45 p.m. Margaret denied it. When asked why the neighbors would believe that she would be shouting at Alan in the days prior to his murder, Margaret replied that, as a teenager, he was always wanting something and often did not do as he was told. She said that she had been worried about him as she had found six new batteries in his coat pocket, which she believed had been shoplifted. The police then alleged that on the night of the murder, Margaret had been angry about Alan, so she'd gone straight back to her home and, in a heated argument with her son, murdered Alan. They then alleged that she'd cleaned up the murder weapon, a knife, turned on the gas taps, and walked the long way around the Crescent, thus entering Mrs. Matthews' home. Margaret denied it and started crying. She then replied, quote, Well, if you said that I have done it, then I must have but I cannot remember. Margaret was visibly distraught and confused and started asking silly questions. She asked the investigators what her husband would think of all this. She also said that she could not go back to her house at number 41 The Crescent and asked if they thought that she should get a new home on Clayton Brook. The interview went on for four hours with Margaret ultimately confessing to murdering her own son. According to the police, she said that when she had come home, she walked into the living room and Alan was wearing his cadet uniform, laying on the carpet watching TV. She figured that he had gone out of the house despite being grounded. She said that Alan denied breaking his grounded status. The investigator then asked her what she did next. Margaret reportedly replied, quote, I stabbed him and stabbed him. She said that she had used the kitchen knife, which she uses for peeling potatoes. She said that she then covered his neck, as she did not want to look at all the blood. Police supposed that she must have tied Alan up to make it look like someone else had broken into the home and murdered him. Margaret was arrested and charged with Alan's murder. She made a statement and signed it, but within three days, she retracted her confession and said that she had been coerced by police. She stated that she was confused, shocked, and debilitated, and that the police convinced her that she had done it. She said that for a moment, she even believed it herself. The police went to the Livesey home and this time collected all the knives in the house. One of the knives seemed to have matched the murder weapon which the police had been looking for. This knife was found in the kitchen drawer. The knife had a wooden handle and one of the rivets from the handle was missing. However, a forensic examination of the knife did not reveal any traces of blood. The police seemed to have given up on the theory about a man with whitish blonde hair, as described by neighbor Peter Nightingale, and instead they were completely focused on Alan's mother. On March 3rd, Peter's brother, Raymond Nightingale, was questioned, and he told police that Peter had come to him and told him that he had never seen anybody leaving the Livesey home. He said that he had lied to the police because he was frightened. Peter was again questioned, and he confirmed that he had lied to the police in his previous interview. He said that he did not see anyone coming out of the Livesey home at 10 p.m., The police eliminated the whitish blonde man theory and focused only on Margaret. Margaret was put on trial on July 2nd, 1979 in Preston Crown Court in Lancashire. Margaret had to undergo two trials, both at Preston Crown Court. The jury at the first trial had looked at all the evidence and the confession by Margaret, which had been withdrawn. 
The jury also heard statements from both women, Christine Norris and Susan Warren. The defense highlighted that both women had not told police the whole truth in their initial interview. The defense argued that both women either withheld information or lied about it because they did not want to be involved. The defense also said that the timing of Susan's statements did not match. Susan, in her second interview, had claimed that she had heard an argument between Alan and his mother around 10.45 or 10.50 p.m. She claims she remembered the time because she was watching the show The City at Risk and that it was almost near the end of the show that she had heard the argument. She said the program had ended at 11 p.m. However, the defense was able to prove that the program had actually ended at 11.15 p.m., which meant that the noise or the argument that Susan heard was actually after 11 p.m. The defense argued that she most likely had heard the panicked voices of Leslie Matthew and Margaret when they found the body of Alan. During her statements, the judge had asked Susan why she'd given two different statements to the police when she did not want to get involved in the murder case. It was understandable, she said, that Susan may have not wanted to say anything, but why then go and say two different statements? The judge was curious how that prevented Susan from not becoming involved. Susan reportedly said, quote, I do not know, really. Christine stuck to her statement that she indeed had heard arguing between mother and son between 10.30 and 11 p.m. as she had looked at the digital clock in her bedroom. Ronald Mason, Susan's boyfriend, stuck to his previous statement and denied hearing anything except the sound of what he described as Alan fooling around with someone around 10 p.m. He says he did not hear any arguments that night. Peter Nightingale was also called to the stand. He now reverted back to his original story of seeing a man with whitish blonde hair coming out of the Livesey home. He said that the police had pressured him into retracting his statement. He also said that he only said his statement was a lie so that he could leave the police station. He now stated that he was pretty sure he had seen a man with whitish blonde hair leaving the Livesey home around 10 p.m. Margaret's friend, who was with her in the pub the night of the murder, Marion Walker, and Margaret's secret lover, Frank Bamber, were also called to the court. Frank Bamber said that they had not left the pub's car park until about 10.50 p.m. Marianne Walker confirmed this and said that she had left them both around 10.50 p.m. at the car park when Frank was cleaning off the ice from his windshield. The journey from the pub to the top of Collins Road would have taken around four and a half minutes. This meant Margaret arrived at the top of Collins Road a few minutes prior to 11 p.m. or even at 11 p.m. Frank recalls that he spoke with Margaret for about a minute or two while Margaret finished her cigarette and left the car. The prosecution argued that Margaret left the car and went straight home, a journey that would have taken her two minutes and 20 seconds. Prosecutors claim that she then argued with Alan, tortured him, stabbed him 10 times, tied him up, washed off the knife, and turned on the gas taps. They then allege that she walked around the Crescent towards the Matthews home, a walk that would have taken about two minutes and 40 seconds. Margaret's husband, Bob, was also called in for questioning, and he said that his wife had a bad temper and had lied to him on numerous occasions regarding domestic matters, such as paying bills. This had led to several arguments between the couple. After hearing all the evidence and statements presented, it was clear the jury was divided on Margaret's guilt. But during the first trial, a close relative of one of the jurors had become ill, and he had been excused from the jury. This resulted in a new trial, which was called in just eight days after the first trial, in the same city and in the same court. In the second trial, Susan, based on prior questioning in the first trial, knew about the discrepancy in her statements regarding the timing of the argument in accordance with the timing of the television show. So this time, she said that she had actually heard the arguments much earlier, sometime between 10.30 and 11 p.m. Mrs. Matthews also changed the timing of her story and said that Margaret had actually arrived at her home around 11.10 p.m. and not at 11 p.m. as she had originally claimed in her statement to police. While the first jury could not reach a consensus after two days of deliberation, the second jury took less than five hours and found Margaret guilty of the murder. 
She was sentenced to life in prison, despite the witnesses changing their statements at the drop of a hat. In 1983, the BBC show Rough Justice aired an episode featuring the case, called, quote, The Case of the Tortured Teenager. The show examined all the evidence and came to the conclusion that Margaret had been wrongfully convicted. The show interviewed the neighbors, Susan Warren and Christine Norris, and they again changed their stories. They now said that they likely heard the noises after 11 p.m., probably when Leslie and Margaret found Alan's body. The show also found another witness, John Kershaw, who claimed that he saw Margaret at the entrance of the Crescent at 11.01 p.m. He had given his statements to the police, but he was never called as a witness to the court. The show also went over the movements of Andrew Matthews and Tommy Rogers, as they had seen Margaret knocking on Miss Matthews' door the night of the murder, prior to running away. Andrew had been at the local disco with his friend Tommy Rogers, they left the club and noticed the clock at the job center at the center of Bamber Bridge. The time was 10.55 p.m. It would have taken them about eight minutes or less to reach home. Andrew and Tommy arrived home and crept under the window to see what was going on in the house, as his mother had not given him permission to go to the disco. Andrew was trying to sneak upstairs to his bedroom without getting caught by his mother when he noticed Margaret coming towards the house. That would put Margaret at Miss Matthews' home around 11.03 p.m. to 11.05 p.m. It would have been simply impossible for Margaret to arrive at the top of Crescent at 11 p.m., then walk or even run the two-minute and 20-second walk to her house first, torture and murder Alan, clean the murder weapon, turn on the gas taps, and then walk or run to Mrs. Matthews' home and still be at the house at 11.03 to 11.05. There was another small detail which the prosecutors had overlooked. When Leslie Matthews arrived at the Livesey home, he had smelled gas in the house. This, they believed, was obviously done by the killer so that whomever entered the home would cause an explosion, destroying the incriminating evidence. If Margaret had killed Alan and opened up all the gas taps, why would she ask Leslie Matthews to check up on Alan, the only one in the home who did not smoke? The murderer most likely was hoping whomever entered the home was either already smoking or would light a cigarette after entering the house. Margaret did smoke cigarettes frequently, so possibly the killer knew Margaret would be the one to enter the house, thus causing an explosion. Another minor detail that was overlooked was the fact that Margaret had tried to close Alan's eyes after his body was found, but was unable to. It is normal for the eyes to become rigid after an hour to an hour and a half after death due to rigor mortis. So, if Alan had died at 11 p.m. or even between 10.45 to 11 p.m., Margaret should have still been able to close Alan's eyes. Mrs. Matthews and Mrs. Rogers, who had had a drink with Margaret, were also asked if they had noticed anything unusual about her. They both said they did not notice anything out of ordinary about the mother. They were then asked if they had seen blood splashes on Margaret, and both women denied seeing any blood. There were plenty of other details and evidence which had either been overlooked or not presented at the trial by prosecution. The first detail overlooked was the fact that prosecutors alleged Margaret had cleaned the knife that was found in the Livesey home, which they believed was the murder weapon. The knife in question had a missing rivet. If it had been used in the attack, it surely would have been stained with blood, but forensic analysis did not find any traces of blood. It would have been impossible for Margaret to completely clean the knife as, due to the missing rivet and the looseness of the hilt, the blood would have gone into the crevices of the wooden handle and would have still remained within the handle of the knife no matter how much one tried to clean it. If that knife was not the murder weapon, then where was it? The crescent had been thoroughly searched by police, but the murder weapon was still not found. At no time did Margaret leave the crescent either. It was a mystery how police would suppose that Margaret got rid of the murder weapon when she never left the crime scene. The show Rough Justice consulted Professor James Cameron, Secretary General of the British Academy of Forensic Sciences. He believed that the murder involved homosexual 
bondage, and that Alan may have consented to tying his hands and having someone sit on him. The killer then slowly dragged the knife over his body before inflicting serious deep cuts. This theory was based on the superficial injuries sustained by Alan. Professor Cameron reviewed the pathology report. He stated that from the pathologist's findings taken at 2.40 a.m., based on the temperature of the body and the presence of rigor mortis, the muscle stiffness after death, along with the way in which the blood had pooled into the dependent parts of the body, suggested to him that the murder had actually taken place about five hours earlier. This would place the murder around the time of 10 to 10.30. He also stated that the report cites little digestion of the stomach contents, and as Alan had had his last meal around 6 p.m., the professor estimated that Alan had died approximately three to four hours after his last meal, which would put the time of death around 9.30 to 10.30 p.m. He believes that the time of death is around 10 p.m. This would coincide with the noises heard by Susan Warren and Ronnie Mason. It would also coincide with the sighting of the whitish blonde-haired man by Peter Nightingale. The show also found evidence, which was neither tested for forensic analysis nor presented during the court trial. Police had found three packets of cigarettes in the home, all from different brands. One Dunhill cigarette packet, which Margaret and Bob used to smoke. One which was an unopened player's number six packet, which was occasionally a brand smoked by Alan. But the third was most significant. The third pack of cigarettes, a pack of Benson and Hedges, were found laying on the carpet about two feet from Alan and were never presented to the court nor to the defense lawyers. No one in the house smoked Benson and Hedges. This was only later noticed in the photographs taken by the crime scene photographer. In the crime scene photographs, they also noticed several cigarette butts in the ashtray on a table near the body, but those were never forensically tested either. Another thing to note is the supposed confession by Margaret herself. In her confession, she stated that she stabbed Alan in the neck and put the sock on his neck afterwards because she could not bear to see him bleeding. However, the sock had cuts on them, suggesting that the killer had put them on before stabbing Alan in the throat. Moreover, Margaret claimed that she had tied Alan up after the murder, even though investigators believe Alan was tied beforehand and had had someone sit astride him. It was also questionable how police could justify the expertise in the knot tying. The binding on the teen's hands, complete with the reef knot, were unlike anything that the mother Margaret was capable of. Over the years, people have come up with their own theories. Some point to a copy of the Daily Mirror newspaper present in the room where Alan died, which featured torture methods utilized by paramilitary groups. If Alan and his friend had read this, that could explain why he was in his army cadet uniform and positioned so strangely. Some in the community wondered if this was a case of boyish roughhousing gone terribly wrong. Might the Daily Mirror article have inspired their own experimentations? It was theorized that the presence of the socks on Alan's neck could have been to shield him from actual stab wounds, but being teenagers, the boys did not realize that the knife would penetrate the sock. In this speculation, it is thought that Alan may have willingly laid on the floor in order to roleplay such torture tactics, which would explain the lack of blood spatter on the wall or on the fireplace, as this would mean Alan would have started in a supine position. Margaret Livesey remained in prison until 1989. Her case was reinvestigated in 1983 by West Yorkshire Police and taken to the Court of Appeals in 1986, but each concluded that the verdict was correct. Margaret was released from prison in 1989 on life parole. She moved to Surrey to live near her daughter Janet. In 2000, she returned to Lancashire to live in a sheltered accommodation in Walton Liddale. She died of throat cancer four months later. She protested her innocence to her grave. The case would remain dormant without any updates until 2016. In 2016, a forensic review was opened into the case, with detectives investigating the case further to see if they needed to reopen it. The outcome so far has been unknown. Mm -hmm.